So, six years, I think. That's what small anniversary here. Uh, I need to get my slides back. Ooh. Yeah, be good. And uh, thank you for showing up. Despite uh, the awesome sun, weather indeed. <laughs> so this was this exactly the day uh, that's supposed to refer as summer in Estonia, or this whole week. And uh, thank you for staying loyal with us and showing up once again. For today's agenda, we have uh, two talks. One is about leadership stuff. Stuff. Uh, <laughs> by Miguel Caron, a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. uh, Literally. Yeah. And the other is uh, more of a hacker stuff site uh, by Peter Marwet uh, from Zoni, data protection officer. Who seen, who remembers Peter? Peter been very active on last event. Uh, making company to Kirill with his GDPR talk. So uh, before we proceed a bit of uh, insights, we asked you what do you think, uh, what, is, what matters in terms of hiring people, especially particularly in the tech industry. Most people think both is, both is important. I wonder about the other topic. Why did we say both? Because there's three options. No, there's. <laughs> I, I have to and both. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, there was a bit clumsy, clumsy But uh, who answered the other? Is there any any in, in the auditorium right now? I just just wanted to hear an example. Like, what is other and most important thing? You know, uh, outfit. Outfit. <laughs> yeah. Would you? Would you hire me then by outfit? I need need to wear a shirt probably. Right? Okay, okay. So uh, from this we proceed with uh, our first talk. Uh, please welcome Miguel to the stage. Hey guys. I'm copying myself. You need the password. Uh, I need to open by itself. Oh. Whoa. You're good. All right. Can you please play uh, for me? I just I'm not used to this the trackpad. Okay. In reverse mode. Here we go. And then we will queue in the slides in about. Yes, one two one two. Is my mic working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The slides so gonna gonna appear. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, how do I move from slide the to arrows. slide? The arrows. Okay. Yeah. Super. Hello everyone, how are you? Um, my name is Miguel. Uh, I'm the new GM, general manager, and uh, board member as well as head of studio for uh, GameSys Estonia. GameSys is a company that uh, head office is in London. It's uh, close to a billion in revenue per year with a little bit more than a thousand people. So uh, we are an online uh, casino business, so uh, any type of uh, online game uh, that are related to real money. Uh, this is uh, uh, GameSys DNA as well as uh, social gaming as well that we do. But I was headhunted by GameSys and I was brought from uh, uh, the traditional video game industry. I'm a gamer, uh, addict gamer from since I'm very young. I'm 45, so I've been playing games since uh, since they started to exist, basically, uh, Pong included. And so I uh, go back to the Mac and the 286 uh, and uh, all these uh, Lyrie's Quest. And uh, I don't know if there's a lot of gamer here, but uh, this is uh, where I'm from. And uh, Games has headhunted me to bring me to uh, Estonia to lead the uh, company that they bought, what's called Snowcap. They bought this company last year, and now we're growing our development uh, and our company here, our, our office here in Estonia. Games is uh, located, uh, as I said, the HQ is in London, Piccadilly Square. So uh, one of the main buildings in Piccadilly Square, if you know a little bit of London. And uh, we have offices in six or seven. Seven countries I've lost track. Uh, basically, all the countries where uh, online casino is uh, allowed by the government. Uh, we're a company that only does uh, online uh, casino game in uh, white market. So we make a deal with the government where all our games get certified by the government, and that's how we do. One of our key partners is Virgin, uh, Virgin Mobile Phone. So all the Virgin Mobile sports betting, uh, online casino games is a partnership between GameSys and, and them. But that's not what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. 
Uh, I, I've been in Tallinn for two months now, uh, so I'm brand new, uh, loving, you have a wonderful city, wonderful country. I came in during the very cold uh, period, uh, end of February, and I'm French Canadian, so for me, uh, your country is very warm. Uh, I'm from a place where during Christmas was minus 36 the whole week, uh, where I'm from, without the wind chill, just the, the, just the cold itself. So uh, for me, minus 20 during that very cold week, was, uh, I was still jogging and taking pictures. The picture I showed you just before was during that week. So, um, and uh, uh, I'm an, a professional executive, so I'm a leader. I'm a leader since I'm a very young. Uh, I was 16 years old in Canada, and I was uh, a leader in the military cadet, so it's like the army, but for people below 18. And then I went to a military university, again in leadership, I worked for the intelligence department and the army. And uh, after that, I became a serial entrepreneur, a serial executive for basically three industry, almost like 10, 10, 10, uh, like uh, six years the first one, five, four years the second one, and a bit over 10 years the, the last one. So IT was my first one. I built an IT consulting business in Canada that grew to about 500 million in revenue. Uh, I was uh, this vice president executive sales and marketing. Uh, we grew it very quickly. It was during the Y2K bug, and this is one, uh, was one of our main product. Uh, so I've been through a lot of different phases, the dot-com bubble, the Y2K uh, bug bubble. So uh, I've, I've learned my skills as a leader through uh, instinct a little bit, uh, as well as through uh, uh, training, uh, which is very important. First of all, uh, I don't want this to be a presentation, I want this to be a discussion. So uh, I know it's hard to ask, sometimes people are shy, and, uh, but please interrupt me. Uh, in Canada, we're born bilingual, uh, but I tend to speak fast sometimes in English, so please stop me if there's something you don't hear, uh, we don't understand. And uh, first question, yeah? Yeah, maybe uh, to just a little solve the monologue. Who doesn't know what way to keep up is? The year 2000 bug. Okay. Everyone else? Uh, okay, that's good. Explain, like, I'll do another one uh, instead. Leadership. Who can tell me what is leadership? Ah, oh, come on, guys. Can you tell me in one sentence, actually? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is one sentence. Ah, oh, try. Uh, yeah, it's actually a result of leadership. Yeah, uh, it's a result. Huh? It's another result of leadership. Uh, leadership is the art to influence people's behavior in a way wanted by the leader. Very important word, art, influence. So uh, it's an art meaning that you have to want it. You, ha you have to have a certain baseline skills in your personality to be a leader. Uh, if you don't like people, if you don't like human being, and you don't like human psychology, you can go through, through all the training and act like a leader, but one of the first thing that uh, allowed us as a species to go above all the other species or above, to, to uh, become on top of the food chain was our ability to uh, see patterns and to adapt to patterns. And so when someone fakes it, you see it right away. When someone is not genuine, you see it right away. In traditional video game, we have a saying that when we do very, very uh, uh, realistic uh, CG video, uh, sometimes it gets so realistic that you get into the, we call it the uncanny valley of dolls. Who knows what is the uncanny valley of dolls? It's an expression. You know? Do you want to describe it? Uh, it's when uh, a human, like when someone trying to represent the human, it's nearly perfect, but it's somehow flawed and that results in a weird like, feeling. It feels like. Uh, uh, yeah, it feels weird. It's, uh, you see something and, and it looks human, but it doesn't have the, let's call it a soul, or let's call it whatever you want to call it, uh, shining through the eyes, right? And then you can fix this with uh, an older per, uh, per, uh, character with more scars and things like that. You can fix it a little bit. But when a leader fakes caring, uh, then you see it right away. So let's get down to it. Yeah, one. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, the result is not really achieved. Uh, if you fake your leadership, the person will fake uh, buying into it, uh, and then it's going to just go fake and fake and fake and fake, and it's going to work for a short term, but at one point, uh, one will backstab the other. One will go on his own way because there's no communication, there's no, people don't trust each other. So leadership without trust, then you get down to, I said two words, uh, art, 
and influence. So at that moment, when the person fakes it, he doesn't do influence, he does manipulation. When you do influence, it's because I truly care about the end result for you. And I'm, the end result that I want you to achieve, if I'm your lead, uh, it's, a, it's an end result that will benefit you and will benefit me. So in that perspective, I will influence your behavior. But when I'm not sincere, then that means I don't care. If I don't care, then I'm trying just to, you, I'm just trying to get you to do something that benefits me. That's called manipulation. Yep. So you're saying that uh, leadership or influence cannot be fixed? It, it's a uh, junior employee coming out of university. Um, might believe you for two, three months, but then it's going to break apart. It's going to break apart, and I've seen it over and over again, and you see it in the news over and over again. The moment someone feels odd and someone is not true to himself, then uh, you, you see it in the, in the, in the end result. Uh, it, it never gets out to a, a very balanced and, and uh, valuable relationship. It ends up just being a poker, poker game. Basically, you know, just playing poker until you get what you want, and the employee knows that you're playing poker with him, so he's trying to, you know, play poker with you to get what he wants, uh, and that creates a tension. And then at one point, one of the two is fed up. If it's the employee, he resigns uh, because he got offer more money somewhere else. If it's the leader, he fires him because he feels attack in his leadership. So, uh, you've, and guys, you've seen this a hundred times in your career. Uh, let's, oh, okay. And this is the first slide. It, this is, answers both of your questions. So intent matters. Results are important, but the intent matters for a leader. Why? You cannot fake it perfectly for all your life. It, you cannot be a different person at work than you are at home all your life. At one point, you, you're going to break up in, in, in this. You cannot, uh, it's like, uh, you know, telling the truth is very simple because at the end of the day, you don't have to remember what lies you said. And, but these type of leaders, they get, I mean, look at the U.S. politics right now. It's just hilarious because it's a kind of a caricatural demonstration of what I'm saying. Uh, we spend more time at work and at home. Uh, sleep uh, excluded, we spend more time with our coworker, with our employee, than we spend with our loved one if you remove sleep. So uh, during a week, during a year. So it's something that being true to yourself, it's a, is, is, you cannot go by it without it. You need to be true to yourself. I mean, we're not talking about doing a job for one year. We're talking about your career, about 20 years as a leader. You will need to be true to yourself. So you need to build a team that fits with you and you fit with them at the genuine level, not at the fake level. Uh, and for an executive, it's your brand. Um, I invite you to check my LinkedIn uh, once, once we're done and uh, to, have a, to, add my, uh, to add yourself or to exchange LinkedIn so we can be connected together. And you'll see if you take the time to look at the uh, referral that I got from LinkedIn. I, I have multiple ones and then, you know, of course, referral, oh, I'll do a good one for you and you can do a good one for me, okay? You can do this. But you'll see that over 20 years, uh, the tone of everyone that I've referred or said something about me is the same tone, is this exactly the same message. And, uh, and we're talking about different companies, uh, 10, 15 years different between these referrals. And you'll see the tone. So uh, basically what I'm teaching you about is who I am. But I am like this as a GM. I was like this as a CEO. I'm like this as a father. And I'm, I'm like this as a, whoops, as a husband as well. Uh, my Facebook is both for my personal life and my public life. Uh, it's both. I have fans from the gaming industry on my Facebook as well as my family, my grandma, and everything. I am who I am, both at work and at home. And for to be an a, a effective and inspiring leader, you cannot do it through fake. You have to be real. So. Uh, the setup, when the headhunter called me, I'm going to tell you the story of Funcom. So Funcom is a very large, uh, massive multiplayer online company that has made multiple games. They were the first one, they were the one to make the first MMO ever uh, called Anarchy Online long, long time ago. I think the, back when I was there, uh, we had the Anarchy Online 10th year anniversary, so that's probably now at 16 or 17 years uh, as a game. 
and it's still running. I still have a lot of fun. We actually had even a birthday party for two players that met and decided to get married, and they flew to Montreal to uh, get married and have the dev team with them. Uh, it's, uh, it was a, one of my favorite uh, studio uh, to play games, so I was playing their games already, and they, they called me to set up a brand new studio for Funcom in Montreal and take over all the production of all their upcoming games. And uh, so, th for me, I, I, didn't, I was not from the video game industry, I was a geek and I was a gamer, but I was not from the video game industry. So when I got that call, I was like, hell yeah, man, I'm gonna get paid <laughs> to, <laughs> to be in the video game industry. Uh, so that was very exciting. But then, uh, this is the first step that I did. Uh, it's I went through, who is Funcom? What type of culture do they have? What is their makeup? What is their DNA makeup in terms of culture? What type of employee they are? And I'm gonna create a satellite for Funcom in Montreal where most of the development will be done there. So I, I want to end up with a cultural makeup that is fit for Montreal, fit for the team that I'm gonna hire and fit for me as well and my personality. I told you, you need to be real, not fake. Uh, but then again, I cannot be completely different than Funcom Oslo, so I need to understand some of their DNA strands to be able to embed them. I really believe in uh, evolution more than revolution. So uh, I call it uh, human osmosis. So really trying to get the feeling of who they are and then uh, start from there and then enhance it with every new employees that we hire. Uh, there was, uh, it was a big challenge because there was absolutely no MMO expertise in Montreal then. Uh, there was Ubisoft, but uh, making a console game, not MMO. So there was absolutely zero. So I knew that I had a challenge and I will need to get foreigners uh, and bring them to Montreal. Um, one of the things that you'll see throughout the presentation is I've, I went through a lot of different leadership training and I read a lot of leadership book and sometimes uh, I'm taking some quotes from them and uh, the quotes that you see there, these books, I really recommend them. Uh, you know, I've done the really heavy Harvard Business School type of stuff, you know, but um, Seven Habits and From Good to Great uh, and Crossing the Chasm, these three books, they're about 160 page, 170 page each and Huh? So, Seven Habits, books? huh? Can you recommend more books? Can? Can you recommend more books? Well, these three books are the first, the, f the first three I would read. Uh, you will get there about 80% of all the leadership concept that you can find in these other big, big books, you know, or biography or thing like that. So, uh, Seven Habits from Stephen Covey, uh, uh, From Good to Great from uh, Jim or James uh, Cullen, and uh, Crossing the Chasm, I forgot the author, but Crossing, crossing, the, crossing the Chasm. I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, there was a fairness issue because Oslo uh, cost of living is way different than Montreal cost of living. So uh, uh, Oslo was sending uh, five of their uh, employees to Montreal at a different, completely different, it's like a London uh, or, or uh, Helsinki employee coming to Tallinn at the same salary as in Helsinki in the studio where the other uh, Estonian would have the Estonian salary, you know, so that, that created a little bit of uh, things to juggle. Uh, we ended up with uh, 42 nationality in the studio, so that was another challenge. Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, third generation of Italian in Montreal, I'm talking a guy that I brought from Brazil to Montreal. So we're talking about true nationality. Um, and then uh, we were at a spot, which you might understand here in Tallinn right now, we were at a spot where uh, the demand for developers uh, for the video game industry was way higher than the offer, the amount of people available. So that created other issue, you know, uh, uh, the fact that uh, it was hard to find the right people. Uh, and then uh, I was new to the video game industry business. I was not new to video game, but to the business. So this was kind of the setup I had when the headhunter called me. Basically, I broke down uh, from, uh, this was a very good experience for me to break down into a presentation because uh, from creating the company with uh, my lawyer in Montreal, uh, being in temporary offices with uh, being the first employee, hiring my first HR, uh, to having 250 employees, it took me about 18 months. So 18 months from zero to 250 employee, and we shipped uh, six games, uh, and those time, uh, not in two years, but uh, I was there five years, we shipped six games that uh, probably produce a little bit over 350 million in revenue. So uh, uh, it was quite of a crazy adventure, but so compressed in time that it allowed me to actually 
build a presentation to show you some of the concepts that I've applied uh, to make it successful. First rule, first chapter. I was alone, got named uh, CEO for Funka Montreal, and then suddenly, pff, fan lining up and uh, employee, oh, you know, and I was like, what is this about, you know? And one of the, especially in the traditional video game industry, one of the first um, reality I faced was ego. Oh my God, executive, uh, people at my level in the industry in Montreal had such a big head and, and their value system was completely off. Uh, these ex game executive never made games, but they uh, attributed all their, their team game success to themselves. And, but they've never did a line of code or drew a single thing or wrote a single game design document. And it's like, my game, my game, my game. And, and I was like, man, something is wrong in the, in the industry. And one of my first rules that I can advise you to, humility, humility, humility. Ego is, is, uh, stops evolution. Uh, when someone has ego, I'm not talking about pride, I'm talking about ego. When someone has ego, it stops evolution because the person thinks he's right all the time. He thinks he has all the skills. He thinks he's above everyone else. So then the mouth opens, the ears close. And we have two ears, one mouth. We should listen twice more than we talk. Uh, ego stops people from learning. And ego uh, creates a situation where you're manipulating your team. You're not leading them. You're not influencing them. So very, very, very important. And one of the first uh, uh, symptom that someone is leading through ego is uh, the way he leads his team. Uh, one of the things that is very important for a leader is to lead through context, not lead through control. Uh, Pablo, uh, do this and come back to me when it's done. This is control. This is I'm leading through control. Pablo, we have a problem with uh, this code. Uh, here's the bug. Here's what the issue is created. And Pablo looks at it and says, yeah, I think I can fix it. Thank you, my friend. Let me know uh, if you need any help or any more resources. I led through context. I explained the context of the situation, and I let the employee decide to act upon it. Not do that and come back to me when it's done. That's control. So this is one of the very easy uh, behavior to notice when leaders start do this, come back to me, okay, are you going to do it? Yeah, okay, do it. Oh, you're gonna, and then it's just to feel themselves they're insecure or they have a big ego, uh, and it it's, uh, makes the employee feel like a doer, not like a thinker, especially for software engineers. Man, we don't hire you guys for your finger, we hire you for your head, and, uh, and leaders lose that concept uh, throughout uh, their growth because the ego takes the room and now they just uh, uh, perceive themselves as um, above the team and it's as you're underneath the team you're lifting the team you're not above them so yeah yeah sure sure sure, sure. like how do you explain them for big companies like the big reputation big names a huge amount of employers they are more in control so like this CEO like the huge CEOs they just saying what should be done thank you Thank you for asking that question. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is such a beautiful. Uh, okay, uh, who's Netflix CEO? Who's Microsoft CEO? Who's okay. Apple CEO? Yeah. Uh, they're a good example. So but we're also like quite enormous. Amount basically, of all the CEOs business. that you know of, these CEOs are not humble. These CEOs are grabbing the attention. Elon Musk, all these type of guys that are not able to actually produce value. Uh, they're, they're not that great businessmen. They were lucky and they, they had great ideas and they were great creators. They were not great leaders. Uh, great leaders, you don't know who they are. Why? Because they don't talk about themselves. They put their company in the forefront. They put their team in the forefront. So there's tons of amazing leaders. Steam uh, is, is a is a monster of a business. Steam, you know Steam? Mm -hmm. Everyone? Who's the CEO? You guys don't know. He, do you know Steam has no uh, position, has no hierarchy? Everyone, everything is decided as a group, is, is a, as, a, as a team, basically. The CEO doesn't brag, doesn't put on the forefront. I, um, if you Google Netflix human resource presentation on Google, you're gonna find on SlideShare a Netflix presentation from the VP HR there. I think he's one of the greatest, she's one of the greatest human business woman in the world. Uh, I still use her presentation. Actually, some of the stuff there, there is from the Netflix pre presentation from 10 years ago. And no one knows her name. So great CEOs uh, put their team in the forefront, put their product in the forefront, put their company in the forefront. 
and they hide. Uh, they don't hide, they, they just, they understand that they are not the value, the team is the value. So uh, uh, Netflix has no vacation policy, everyone can, is unlimited vacation. Uh, basically your job has to be done, uh, unlimited paid vacation. And there's no control. They have no limitation of expense account. It's basically the rule is spending like it's your own money. Make sure it has value. And that's it, you know, I'm pretty sure the controller if someone would start spending way much, then he would approach it, but it's through context, it's not through control, in a sense that it's not like they haven't put a rule, it's common sense, basically. And maybe, maybe also, like in a different way, like uh, there are good examples, maybe new wave CEOs, but there are also old wave CEOs, like for this big, much of banking, yeah, yeah. finance, that sector. So, uh, totally different from that. 100%. Then uh, these CEOs, uh, I said leadership through context, not through control. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that you cannot have processes as well. And some of the processes can make sure to control how the money goes, how the business goes. But then the way you lead, what you tell employee, is not uh, don't spend that much. It's like this is the general rule. Uh, if you go below this, uh, then you have to excuse or explain why. You know. So it, it's their, their leadership is still, you know, uh, I'll tell you, if I'm a leader and this is this, uh, we're a big company, I'll say, uh, I'm, I'm not just putting a stupid rule there. I'm saying this is the limit. If you go beyond that limit, if it makes business sense, just let me know. So I'm not trying to control you. I'm saying uh, we're a lot of people, uh, like 5,000 employees. So at one point, uh, I don't know exactly what's going on. So I have to put some process in place. But the way you lead them, the way you talk to them, and what you expect from them is through the context. You explain to them the reason why. Uh, one good example. company called ThoughtBot. Maybe somebody knows ThoughtBot. This is a software consultancy company, uh, international. So what they do with, with people they hire, so like with, when they onboard a person, then uh, they basically tell them, okay, buy yourself what you need and file the report like how much you really need to compensate you. And this is like throughout the entire career. If you go to the K, if you ever need something, you just buy it and then company pays for it. Yep. And then basically use your common sense to, to get your stuff. Exactly. Done. Exactly. And, and these companies are, are uh, again, they don't brag about this. They're, for them, it's just natural. Um, so uh, I was then uh, three, four months in uh, after uh, creating the company with the lawyer and everything. Uh, then we were about 20 dev, uh, so one of the uh, very important rules for, at that point I was the only, uh, I was the CEO and I had no, I was dev, it was, I had no lead or no leader. So at this point, uh, it's very important for leader, if you, we're talking about culture and leader outsource the recruiting, outsource the interviews, uh, it won't work. As a leader, if it's your business, if you just started a business, uh, you have to do all the interviews, every single one. Uh, at Funcom, including QA, that were paid minimum salary in, in Montreal, I did every single interview, the first one, until we reached uh, about 100 people. And then the, it, it was not practical for me to do all the interview then. So uh, I started to interview only the senior roles and the, the leaders, those who I'm hiring and will automatically have some people uh, under the, uh, following their, their, their leadership. So these people, I would still interview them. Right now at GEMSYS, uh, here in Estonia, I'm doing every single one interview. So basically my art director or my uh, uh, lead software engineer will come to me and say, well, I need two Java, I need a tech lead, I need this, this. So I'll interview, I'll, I'll check probably 100 CV, I'll probably interview uh, for one position, I'll probably interview uh, 10 person, and I'll pro present four to my lead software engineer that I'll tell him, you choose any of these four, uh, if uh, the, you just take the best that you like. Uh, now you just need to test it for his technical knowledge. In terms of the human being, I, I know my, my employee because I've interviewed everyone, right? So I know who fits with who. So I, I know that he's gonna fit with my lead. So uh, my, my uh, employees here, and uh, it was like, whoa, it's great service because uh, th this is really what happened. Uh, we even have uh, Pablo here, that is exactly what happened. <laughs> so my lead uh, said, I like this guy. I contacted Pablo, I interviewed him. 
fantastic interview, then brought uh, had a second interview with the lead. Uh, sorry, Pavel, I know you've been putting you on the spot. You're the only one from Gamesys that could come today. So, <laughs> And uh, uh, then he was hired, and since then he's been an incredibly valuable uh, employee. Uh, so do the interview. Third rule, so important, and this one is everyone, every leader I met, not 100% of the time, but more than 50% of the time, most leaders that I've met uh, are breaking that rule. When you give responsibility to an employee, you attach to that responsibility, there's an unbreakable chain to authority to make that responsibility. So uh, if I say Stanislav, you're responsible to build that system, uh, I'm not going to say you have to build it and, and go micromanaging exactly, and you have to do it this way. When you split authority from responsibility in that situation, uh, the leader is untouchable. He's going to win because uh, if he keeps the authority, uh, he can dictate whatever he wants. But then if the project fails, it's going to be Stanislav because he has the responsibility. But I have the authority. So uh, you have to fuse both. Stanislav, uh, this is the problem. And then lead through context, right? This is the problem. Could you help me fix the problem, bring a solution to the problem? Uh, let me know what you need. You have the authority to make the call. Do we need to buy a software? Do we need to hire so someone? Do you need time? Do you need what, whatever you need? You know, you have to fuse authority with responsibility. Now that doesn't mean blind trust. It means using smart trust. And smart trust is building a sandbox around Stanislav uh, that you know that he has freedom in that in that box. But let's say he goes AWOL and he goes rogue, he cannot damage your business within that box. And then once he made that his task and you're satisfied and you see that you can trust him, you get his sandbox a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And at one point you just step out of the sandbox and, and he's the one just on the beach with all the sand doing his stuff. Uh, so this is extremely important. When a boss gives you, when a you lead gives you a, a, a responsibility but he keeps the authority, you say, no, no man. I need the authority with that responsibility. So now we were 50 devs, about six, eight months down the line. We are 50 devs, no more. That's a real beach, by the way, in Brazil. I don't know how people can have fun there. Uh, so uh, this is, or, or, or Japan, I think. I'm not sure. It's one of the big beach. But um, 50 devs, we had no more room. Uh, we were uh, uh, basically in, in a, a very small uh, basement office, kind of, temporary office. Uh, and then we need to, uh, uh, we get to a, a point, and you'll see it as your business grow. Oh, it's going well. Ooh, okay, I have to upgrade my skill as a leader. Oh, it's going well. Oof, oh, I have to upgrade my skill as a leader. You'll hit walls like this. It's not just a straight, sm smooth growth. It's, it's, you'll feel, ah, oh, I'm on top of the hill. Oh, no, I'm actually just at the bottom of the next big hill, you know? You'll feel that. Uh, and uh, one of the very important, when you reach, uh, that 50 employee mark, um, you have to start paying attention. I don't know if you noticed since I've spoken, I've, I haven't used absolute word. Never, always, the best, the worst. I will say one of the best. I will say rarely, you know? Words matter. Uh, oh, this is shit. Uh, words matter. Uh, so th this is at, at, at that point, as a leader, Every time you open your mouth is a leadership discussion. So it's very important that you're careful with the word you use because words have power over the culture. Uh, these jokes, either sexist or racist or these type of thing, they, they insinuate themselves into the culture. They're not good, they're not healthy. Uh, understand that words have power. So choose your words correctly. Uh, as an example, praise. I didn't say praise and reprimand. I say praise and redirect. Why? Because reprimand is the relationship between uh, parents and their kids. And uh, that's not the relationship a leader should have with his employee. We're all human beings. Society decided that my job gets paid a lot. 
uh, just because society decided it, because of a mathematical ratio of how many leaders for how many people. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the value. It has really to do with uh, just the way society decided to reward this. So I, I understand this. And when I'm talking to an employee, I'm not talking to them like they're kids. I understand that that employee has four kids, and he's a father, and he's as evolved human being as I am. There's nothing, uh, a lot of things different, but nothing better or worse. We're just human beings trying to uh, add value to our company based on our skills and our personality. So uh, uh, be very careful with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the words you use. It's not just the word, it's the body language. So if I, uh, uh, um, Stanislav has a, sorry, I got a, a brain fart. Stanislav uh, is, is at his desk and I need to talk to him about something uh, that's not just uh, you want a beer after tonight or whatever. If it's something important, I, I come to his desk and uh, Favlo can tell you, I always put the knee down to, because he's sitting, right? To be at the same level, to talk to him at the same level. Uh, or I'll draw a chair. I'm not going to go, hey, uh, what about the deliverable? Where is it? You know? uh, it's the same thing. When I come to shake your hand, I put my hands, palms up to make you feel welcome, not to make you feel dumb, uh, submissive to me. I make you feel welcome to me. So, and I do a first step, hello, my name is Miguel, to make you feel good. These things have an impact. Uh, if, when you do them um, the right way, it just, it, it just flows naturally and people feel comfortable. And when they feel comfortable, they open up. When they open up, they tell you more about what's going on in your studio, talking about being genuine, and you cannot fake this. If you think yourself better than other people, they will feel it. Even if you do the ha-ha, hee-hee, ha-ha, like this, they'll say, fuck you, man. They'll, they'll feel it. Sorry for the YouTube. <laughs> Motto, vision, mission, they mean something. They have to mean something. Most of the time, they don't mean something, but that's because the leader didn't want them to. They just went through the, the motion, you know? They mean something. Do it with your team and find out who your soul is as a company, as a business. Man, this one is so natural. But again, it's something that leader fails to do. Um, oh, Miguel, uh, one of my lead was telling me, one of my exec was telling me, oh, Miguel, sorry for that. Uh, this employee didn't understand it correctly. You know, uh, he, he's not good. I said, first of all, Mr. VP, uh, I said, uh, the employee is not either good or bad. His work is good or bad. Don't judge people, judge their work. That's the first thing, you're not their father. Uh, you're the leader, very different. Second of all, it's your job as a leader. If I choose a leader, if I take, uh, I need an art director, I'm not gonna choose the best artist. I'm gonna check, I'm gonna uh, uh, promote the best leader that knows heart, and not the best artist. And, and this is something that is, uh, I don't know why leaders forget this, but uh, like that, uh, that employee, uh, that VP was telling me, he didn't understand it right. I said, no, you didn't explain it right. The reason why I promoted you VP was because you have more uh, EQ, emotional IQ skills. You're, you're able to put your frame of mind aside and understand the frame of mind of the other person to adapt your message to this. Leaders, my ability is the way I interact with Pavlo is different than the way I interact with Dimitri, the way I interact with Kaya, the way I interact with every one of my leads. I change the way I interact with them. I'm still me, I'm still genuine, but I change the packaging of how I interact. Dimitri is my uh, lead system guy. He likes things like short, hard, no cream, no nothing, like blah, you know? Kaya likes it well presented, you know? So I do it well presented. With Dimitri, is like, boom, boom, boom. You know, he's laughing because it's his boss. <laughs> uh, so uh, leaders adapt to the employee, not the other way around. So this was, uh, now we were 100 dev. This was the look of how uh, the construction of the office uh, was. So you can see uh, that it was uh, really like a, a blank slate. So when we designed the new office, I designed it with every single employee. If you knew how many surveys we did and how many discussion on how the office would be built. Uh, and uh, guess what? I told you about leaders' humility. I told you about uh, that you serve your employee, not the other way around. I've told you about uh, all these type of things. Now, do you think I got a big uh, closed office in one of the corner with all the windows? 
No, you know, obviously not. You have to be consistent as a leader. So if I say, guys, I'm there to serve my employee, uh, I work for them, they don't work for me. If I tell them that uh, uh, humility is important, if I tell them that the, v the leader is not the one that creates value, the employee are, the leader is the catalyst of the value. If I tell them all of this, and then I get a super huge corner office with a big window and everything, and, a, and an assistant that brings me coffee and things like that, it's like I'm, I'm not being genuine. I'm faking it, right? So basically, the end result of the studio was, uh, you see the space, it was a large space. All the executive office, we were in the middle of the studio, and we were in aquariums. So our offices was completely transparent. There was glass, basically. And all the windows of the floor were for the employee. And uh, so on top of that, uh, we were in the middle, so employee could see what we're doing uh, all day long. And you could see through my, from one side of the window through my office to the other side of the window. So uh, the employee saw me doing QA on the games. They saw me playing the games. Uh, secret, well, I think I played 2,000 hours before the game got shipped. So uh, they, they, they saw me meeting with other employees. They, they saw me working. So I was leading through example as well. And I was, uh, my, I was um, walking my talk. So, by the way, again, this is from the seven habit, built with the end in mind. So the end, the end objective of how we would build the studio was to make the employee more efficient, make them more happy, make them more comfortable, was not for the leader to have an ego trip, right? So the end in mind was serving the employee in the best possible way and keeping the real estate for those that actually do the work uh, and those that uh, leads we got very small office and basically aquarium uh, type. Okay. Yeah. So chapter five. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've I've censored myself, but you know what I mean. Eh, eh, politics, right? So when you get to 100 people you start having a little bit of internal politics. And this is something uh, I address very actively, and I address it with a uh, grenade. Because I, very early in the studio, I didn't want to have any office politics. And this is something that is very polluting. It, it adds a lot of fake obstacles into your business value and your business growth. So this was uh, a very, very important uh, element. And the way I, I define this, I'm French Canadian, by the way, so sorry for, but it's so beautiful in French. Focus sur l'être et non le paraître. It means uh, focus on how you are and not how you look. So uh, how you look like you are, basically. Uh, paraître, it's more about not the way you look physically, but the way you're behaving. So uh, again, it goes down to being genuine, not faking it. So uh, uh, one, a lot of the leaders, when uh, we're, again, to your first question, these leaders that uh, make uh, themselves a little bit uh, godly, uh, they add a lot of uh, uh, aura around themselves, these leaders are adding value to themselves, to their brand, to their personal brand. Uh, sometimes it has some uh, s uh, positive side effect to their company, uh, but it's not the objective. You should focus, like I was telling, giving you the example of Netflix or Steam, you should focus on adding value to your business, to your employee, to your company, not adding value to yourself. This will come through the success of your business. Uh, Netflix CEO is, is, uh, and founder is quite happy financially. He doesn't need ego, he doesn't need bragging rights. He just needs to the fact that Hollywood is, is scared of Netflix. That's it. Like he's, you know, at home drinking wine and. I did my job, my team is happy, and the biggest guys in, in the entertainment industry are afraid of me, so I did a good job. Um, very important as well, uh, don't expect, uh, if you're an asshole and you're a CEO, don't expect your culture to be positive. It won't work, as simple as that. Uh, the only company that I've seen it work for a very, very short time, and that's the one exception that makes the rule, is Uber. Uh, that's the only, and that's probably because the driver are kind of a uh, freelancer. That's probably the only reason why. But, uh, and even then it depends where. The closer they were to the CEO, the more anal uh, they were in terms of their culture. So uh, culture fl flows from the top. If you have, if you're a great CEO and, and you naturally follow these rules, but you hire an asshole as a VPHR, forget about it. I mean, uh, you're gonna have uh, counter uh, negative antenna to the type, to the positive antenna that you're trying to create in a studio. So, 
Uh, this is um, uh, a story, a legend that was telling, t told to me. Uh, I worked in the Middle East as well, and uh, it was uh, a guy that was telling me a story about uh, a legend, or a, uh, I don't know uh, the English word for it, but it's like a proverb. Is that a word in English? Proverb? You should know it better. Yeah, I don't, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> but it's like a story that has a, a meaning at the end. And it's basically a guy that was uh, lost in the Sinai Desert with his camel, and he saw an oasis. And he stopped at the oasis. To, uh, he, there was a Shia uh, Muslim priest that was at the oasis. And uh, he stopped there. He said, oh, um, uh, can I spend the night at the oasis? The priest said, of course, no problem. He said, uh, well, priest, should I let my camel untie and trust God that my camel will not leave during the night? Or should I not trust God and tie my camel to the tree to make sure that it's going to be there when I'm going to wake up? The shir said, it's easy, my friend. It's very easy. Tie your camel and trust God. Do both, you know? So this is uh, what I'm, I'm telling you. Trust, trust, trust your employee. The moment you don't trust someone you've hired, you're advertising to the whole world, I'm a moron. I'm a stupid leader because I hire people that I don't trust. I mean, if you go through all the systematic interview and all the step to do it, and then you follow Smart Trust, where you build a sandbox and you grow the sandbox around that employee, why shouldn't you not trust him? You know, uh, this, is some, this is a concept. Oh, on top of not being the right thing to do, it's a lot of effort not trusting people. You know, I, I'm too lazy for that. Uh, too lazy for not trusting people. So you trust people, you learn uh, to, uh, um, identify uh, uh, basically uh, uh, symptoms that you might not want to trust that person, but you still go through the motion. You just make sure that the sandbox is appropriate for the element that you doubt about that person. So uh, trust, trust, trust your employee. If you hire the, the, the person, then you need to give him the chance to prove himself. So trust your employee, that's another very, very important thing. But then after you trust them, you know, uh, this is the, the trust God, yeah, sure. But tie your camel, monitor them as well. Uh, not control them, but monitor their performance and have an open discussion about their performance. This is very important. So 200 dev. Uh, now it's getting packed. The, this is the new office. Uh, I don't know if there was another picture there. Yeah, so this, this is, you can see this in, uh, reception of the new office. So. Um, Eight rules uh, from the seven habits, sharpen the saw. That means training, that means coach. The, uh, sharpening the saw in the seven habits, it's uh, basically there's three pillars of that. There's a fourth one, but let's not talk about it. Uh, it's uh, spiritual. The fourth one, I, I fused it with the third pillar uh, in my, uh, in my uh, uh, execution of, of Stephen Covey's uh, habit. So the three pillar is um, your brain, learn more stuff get more knowledge into your brain. Physical, be healthy. This is a tough one uh, that I've done with, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, Could people look healthy here, but uh, I worked in California in the US and I was telling my leaders, man, if you're not healthy physically, if you're not able to lead your own body, if you don't have the discipline to lead your own body, how do you want me to trust you? I mean, leading yourself is the first step, right? Is, is being clean, being healthy, eating good food, training physically. This is like uh, learning. These are, are, are the first step of being independent as a human being. If you want to lead people uh, and people will depend on you, then you need to be independent as a human being. So uh, if uh, I don't have the discipline to do physical activity every week, uh, we, we can bring tons of excuses. But at the end of the day, if I don't have that discipline, why would I have the discipline to implement all these things? Why do I have the discipline to be humble towards my employee? Uh, why do I have the, all these discipline if I'm not able to stay healthy? So your brain, your body, and then uh, the one that I fused uh, together, the spirituality and the emotion, I fused them into one. So it's basically your state of mind, your, your personality. If you're in a bad mood all the time, if you're very, very pessimist and, and, and uh, negative person, and again, it's going to be very hard for me to follow you as a leader, uh, as, a, as an employee, because uh, any type of tri environmental trigger can get you into a bad mood. So, man, I started to be insecure uh, about your leadership because I don't know 
if it's going to rain today, you're going to start being in a bad mood, and my project is going to be canceled. It's like, uh, how do I deal with that? So very, very important, shop in the saw. This is where you're trying to get yourself completely useless. This is where you want to become, an, uh, uh, where you want your leads to become independent, where you would leave your business for two, three, four months, come back, and the business has behaved the way it would have behaved even if you stayed there, if you have an added value to it. So it would just keep uh, on cruise control, basically. So this is the moment that you really have to, to start training your team. It's train, coach, measure, train, coach, measure, train, coach, measure, train, coach, and again and again and again. Now, 250 dev. So that was 18 months, a year and a half after I went with my uh, uh, lawyer to uh, the notary to create Funcom Canada Inc. Uh, we were um, 250 employees, uh, 42, around 42 nationalities, uh, and uh, one of the Im most important rule, from the beginning to the end, leader are there to serve. We serve our team, we serve our customer, we serve our sh uh, shareholder, we serve our employee, we serve the people that we lead. And serving meaning that we're the one that have to adapt to their needs. We, basically, I see my role more as a football coach. Uh, I'm not the one scoring goals, uh, but I have the ability to choose the team. I have the ability to help them with strategy, but at the end of the day, they do the work. They're the ones scoring goals. And, and it's really the way that I perceive uh, leadership. Yeah, so uh, the way I describe uh, it, the leader is the black powder, uh, and the employees are the bullet. So uh, the, the, a bullet, I can throw it hard and it's still gonna hurt you, it can still do damage. Uh, black powder uh, in a gun as a blank just makes noise. An executive without a good team uh, just makes noise. It's, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it just makes noise. There's, no, uh, no true impact. The impact, the value created is the team. So the team creates one, two, three of value, and I will add multiply by two. My leadership will multiply it by two, by three, by four, by five. That's what my leadership does. But if my team has a value of zero, there's no amount of leadership I can do that can create value uh, for the long-term value. I'm not talking about fake marketing bubbles. I'm talking about real long-lasting value. Uh, as an example, this was a group photo. Uh, do you see me sitting in the chair with, uh, on my throne with uh, my minion around me? No, not at all. Uh, you cannot even define who's a VP, who's a QA. It, everyone is mixed, by the way, I'm, I'm here. Uh, and um, this uh, girl over here uh, was my first employee. She was uh, coming out of university, she was 24. And when I left uh, Funcom, she was 28. And uh, she became the GM. So uh, just to give you an example, and that's one of the things that made me the most proud. Ten and final rule. If you want what others do not have, you have to do what they don't. So be innovative, be crazy, and stick to your value. Don't bend your value for money. Don't bend your value for anything. I know it's, it's hard to say, but uh, it never pays off. I mean, it pays off to the moment, but uh, man, those that have been able to create fake value, cashed in, and have a beautiful life after. I mean, there, there is some, obviously. I told you not to use absolute word. There is some, but uh, I don't want to be one of those, personally. I want to be someone that creates true, long-lasting value. And to do this, you need to build USP, unique selling point, unique selling features to who you are as a leader, as well as what your company is providing as a service. So uh, this is an example when uh, in traditional uh, massive online games, when the project ends, uh, there's a natural uh, flow out of employee because uh, like Age of Conan, I had a team of 150, Secret World, I have a team of probably when we finished it, about, we were about 250 working on Secret World, uh, including uh, Beijing. This is only Montreal, but we had the uh, Beijing studio as well. So uh, these are big groups. So when we shipped Secret World, I had to do a uh, layoff of about uh, 50, 60 people. So what I did, uh, I called every CEO in Montreal for all the large video game company. So uh, Yanis from Ubisoft, uh, Stefan from Aidas, back when it was Aidas. There was THQ that back then as well. So basically eight large scale studio, they had uh, 500 open position uh, in their site. I invited them into my studio to do a job fair in my studio 
with each conference room I had a logo for Ubisoft and things like that. So when I, I met with all the 250 employees, I said, guys, I have a, a, a news. It's not bad or good. I have a news. Uh, we have to cut 60 people. But wait, don't panic. Uh, HR is going to work with you on Monday and Tuesday on your CV, on your LinkedIn. And then Wednesday and Thursday, you have each of those that will be affected. You have eight interviews planned for uh, Thursday and Friday in our office. So you just need to come here, have your CV uh, in hand. And they were not even fired yet. They were not even noticed yet. So, uh, and then these headhunters, these uh, HR people that came from my competitor, I told them, here's the list. You're not allowed to pick and choose who you interview. You have to interview all 60 employees during the two days. Uh, then you can pick and choose who you want. But I, want them, I wanted them to go through the motion of interviewing everyone. And by the next Monday, 92% uh, of my, the employee I would have laid off had a new job at a higher salary, uh, obviously, because you always get a higher salary. And then uh, by the end of Friday, 100% except one had uh, a new job. So uh, basically, I had to only fire one person. Everyone else resigned, uh, which means I saved about $400,000 into uh, Canadian penalty when you do mass layoff. You have to pay more notice in, in Canada. So uh, I saved uh, a little bit over $300,000. I made a lot of uh, a studio happy. I made these 60 p employees super happy. And it's funny because what it says in French is uh, to invite the wolf in the shipyard. Uh, but that's um, uh, when you read the article, actually, uh, I actually tell the uh, journalist, I said, you didn't get it, man. I said, I sent all my woof in everyone's shipyard. Uh, because the employee, when I did this, instead of laying them off, I found a job for them. Instead of laying them off, a new job at a higher salary at my competitor, these employees stayed loyal to me. And when I uh, left Funcom, uh, over 30 of these employees followed me in the next studio. And I have a lot of devs that have followed me in three, four companies that have followed me because of that. So uh, do the crazy. When I was doing this, everyone was like, ah. you know, even Funcom Oslo um, uh, was uh, really uncomfortable with this. And I said, but that's the way I'm going to do it, my friend. I remember, uh, don't bend on your value. I said, that's the way I'm going to do it. If you don't want me to do it this way, then send someone from Oslo to do the layoff, because I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'll be busy trying to get jobs for these guys. Uh, so this is really what I mean by go going a little bit further and trying to do things that other people don't do. Yes? So uh, <laughs> that uh, one guy, I'm not sure if he stayed in the video game industry. Uh, he was um, a little bit, uh, it was a new employee, and he was, uh, uh, his personality was a little bit awkward, uh, OCD a uh, little bit, uh, which for us, with our open culture and the way we were able to interact with people, it, it was absolutely no problem. And he was a QA guy, so we actually, the OCD part was a benefit for us. But uh, it, it was hard for these big American company uh, or French company like Ubisoft. Uh, he, uh, but I, he was the type of guy that was uh, more surfer type of guy. Uh, so uh, I'm pretty sure that he was happy. So he was not disappointed. He expected it. So that's the one guy that we can uh, help. Uh, next. There's another question. Oh, yeah, sure. But shouldn't you judge the work instead of the character? Sorry? Shouldn't you judge the work instead of the character? Uh, how do you ask? Uh, because to his answer, you answer to his character, not his work. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was not a problem, as I said, because yeah, I don't. You answered with the character, not the, with the work. No, because uh, in interview, uh, I was not the one that interviewed uh, this guy. It was Ubisoft HR that interviewed this guy. It was uh, Square Enix HR that interviewed this guy. This company, or at HR level, did not follow these guidelines. So they were judging the character. They were not judging uh, the feedback that we provided with this guy. Uh, when I interviewed the guy, I saw these uh, tick and this, uh, as I said, he was borderline autistic a little bit. So I saw these, uh, you know, autistic is? Yeah. yeah. So he was uh, borderline autistic with a little bit of a CD, but he was a fantastic employee because I, we didn't judge the character. We judged the work and the character, the team adapted around him. You know, he was a little bit, uh, like having a, a child in the office. But the work was amazing for us. But then at one point, I'm not his parent. Uh, so I, I put the table for him to find a new job. But then he's the one that has to actually go get it, right? Uh, at one point. This is another important point, though. As a leader, 
I'm always extremely careful to involve myself in the personal life of people. We are, uh, in a sense, because we're paying them and it is like, it's, it's hard to separate the limit. But uh, I'm very careful before I involve myself. Like, uh, Adamo, I say, you're good, sorry, you didn't get a job. He said, no, but it's okay, I'm fine. Then if he tells me he's fine, uh, I work there. I, I stop there, I stop my leadership work there. But you're, you're right, I mean, uh, uh, both are important, uh, character and result, both are important, but they're important in the sense uh, not to be a defined character, they're important in the sense that that character has to work well with your culture, has to work well with the rest of the team. If it works well, uh, then it's fine. Uh, in Game Sisera, uh, to give you a very uh, pure example that you will understand very clearly if you're uh, Estonian, if you're from here, uh, I, I have kind of two studio within Game Sisera in Tallinn, I have a game, Studio and I have a system, a technological studio as well. And just by luck, um, most of the people in the system are Estonian Russian, uh, and most of the people in the game team are Estonian Estonian. Uh, and obviously, when uh, I add different personality, I've already added, like, uh, Pablo is uh, from Ukraine, so, uh, and he's the system team, so I've added different nationality already to the system team. And same thing with the game team, but I'm, I'm measuring it from team to team, what type of spices this team needs. And I'm careful. If uh, the team are super uh, conventional and uh, traditional, uh, I'm gonna, not the first guy I'm gonna add it, is not gonna be a crazy foreigner with all kinds of different liberal views. I'm gonna add one that is a little bit more liberal than they are, and I'm gonna add more. Remember osmosis, evolution, not revolution. And after one year, I'll get to the taste that uh, is the best one for the whole group. So that's basically the way I see it. Now, final chapter, really? Nah, not really. Building a culture that survives you of your business. So uh, when I left Funcom, I actually left it and I sold, I left it because I sold it. I sold the Funcom Montreal to uh, uh, a company. And uh, when I sold the studio, uh, the team actually stayed there. I told you the lady became the GM. And uh, uh, some of the guys that had followed me when I crossed to Europe, some of the guys that had followed me in another studio actually went back to the uh, Funcom Montreal, which was called Envisio, because the culture is still exactly the way, the type of culture that I'm, I'm talking to you about. New owner, new leadership, uh, same people. And I call this uh, a cultural human rubber band. So when you were happy, when you felt empowered, when you felt comfortable, when you had no fucking politics, when you had uh, no one talking down to you in your environment, uh, you want that again. And uh, this is a very, very um, uh, powerful uh, result of having an e effective and uh, uh, balanced and positive culture in your company. Um, <laughs> our leader are perfect? Hell no, remember, humility, right? <laughs> We're not perfect. Uh, I make mistakes every week, uh, not to say every day. Uh, but when I do make them, uh, those mistakes, I'm very open about them. And for me, admitting your mistake, um, uh, admitting that sometimes you don't do what you teach. Uh, as a leader, I, I'm talking about all this all the time, so man, it gives a big pressure on me to be like this all the time, right? Uh, but I, I'm a human. Sometimes I've, I, I, I might have off days sometimes. It's been a while, but I might have off days sometimes. And uh, uh, when I do, it's like, oh man, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, you're right, I was wrong. Uh, sorry for that. And to admit a mistake actually need a lot more strength. Those leaders that think that they have to show perfection and they have to show strength all the time and their tone and how they, how they dress and everything, uh, it's completely artificial, it's completely fake. The, this is easy, faking it is easy. Uh, being, allowing yourself to be open, allowing yourself to be uh, criticized, allowing yourself to be judged uh, as a leader is extremely healthy uh, and it, it needs strength to do it. Uh, and it needs strength when the person does too much of it and push into the disrespect and like, whoops, okay, man, you didn't get it. Uh, I'm like this to help you. I'm like this to help myself. I'm not like this so you can run over me. Uh, it's, it's all about communication, but first you have to open your your card, and you have to be, again, genuine. Uh, this is another one that is, man, it's so logical for me, and, and, and uh, people, oh, I saw you talking to, oh, you're going to one of my competitors. When someone resigns, uh, and uh, were you there when, uh, no, you were not there yet. 
uh, there was even one that uh, we make a party. When someone resigns at all my businesses, and in GameSys we did the same thing, a guy resigned to go to work for one of our competitors, and we make a party. Why do you think it's more important to uh, show how you appreciate that employee, if he was a good employee, when he leaves than when he comes in? Because when he leaves, he's, done, he's worked for you for three years. He's added value to your business for three years. 20% of your product, of your game, 20% uh, of the code is made by that guy, right? He's the one that added it. He's the one that added the value. And, and at one point in time, you could not create a challenge enough for him, or you could not uh, reward him the way he needed or he wanted to be rewarded. Uh, just be happy for him and, and thank him for all the value that he's created. Uh, and this is something that uh, is a little bit disappointing uh, sometimes when uh, an employee resigns and I'm like, so what are you doing? Where are you going? Uh, Oh, I'm not sure, and when I know exactly where he's going. But I said, man, if you tell me, uh, I'm going to be uh, as happy. If you tell me you go to work, I have no problem with that. Um, my job is to make sure my company is always above those of the computer in terms of technology. So uh, uh, for them to uh, have one of my employees, I don't, uh, it's, it's about you. It's about the employee. I re truly and sincerely care about that employee. Uh, and I gave them the chance to tell me, and they're like, no, no, I'm just gonna go do this. And I'm like, man, be honest with me, it's okay. Uh, and, and this is something very important. Don't, don't, you know, oh, you're my best friend. And then the guy's resigned, I hate you. You know, that, that's again, not being truthful to yourself and it's not being a, a genuine leader. It's being kind of a fake leader. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm your leader only if you work for me. If you don't work for me, fuck you, you know? So uh, this is not uh, the right approach. Uh, so loyalty, uh, don't ask employee to be loyal to you or your company. Ask them, ask them to be loyal to the culture, to the way of being, to the behavior. The moment I turn asshole uh, at GameSys, I'm expecting these guys to resign or to uh, try to find a way to kick me out. So uh, it's, I'm not asking them to be loyal to Miguel or loyal to GameSys. I'm asking them to be loyal to the way I lead them, the way I interact with them, and the way uh, GameSys interacts with them. This is intelligent loyalty. It's not dumb, blind loyalty. And uh, why doing this? Uh, not to slow the leaders down. Allow them to surpass you. This is allow them to surpass you and be proud if they do. You know, uh, they brought you where you are. Now let them shine. My employee made my LinkedIn. All the successes that you can see on LinkedIn is cre were created by my teams, not by me. Uh, I was able to organize them correctly, but they were the ingredient. They're the value. I was able to shoot it in the right direction, but they were the value. So when they surpass me and when they become like uh, my CTO there is the CEO of, of Funcom, and my GM there, uh, the global Funcom, uh, who was my CTO from Montreal, is the CEO of Rui for the whole Funcom. And uh, my HR uh, girl is now the GM of Envisio, which was the division Funcom Montreal, which I sold to my friend. So my leaders actually has uh, grown tremendously, and this is one of the uh, biggest, that's a reward I have as a leader. So, no, it's not the end. Good culture never ends. It translates into strong network, friendship, and amazing game. And before I show you these links, I just want to show you some uh, picture of uh, my time at Funcom. And you can, uh, this is Rui. This is the gentleman that is now CEO of, uh, he was my CTO, but he's now CEO of uh, the whole Funcom group. Uh, these are my kids. This uh, is my, was my HR who became uh, the GM I mentioned to you. This was my 40th, 40th birthday anniversary, I think. Uh, this is when I was, uh, oh yeah, I forgot, I made a Warhammer, uh, made a Warhammer game as well. Uh, I forgot to bring a, a video for those that are Warhammer fans, but uh, I was doing a Warhammer uh, GDC or E3 presentation, and I think I'm this guy. <laughs> I, uh, I lost a bet against player, and uh, the consequences was, was this. So um, I'll just, and we're hiring. So I just want to show you, we are. Can you bring me the, uh, what's where you were, the two yes. trailers? Yeah, and we're done. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have time? Yeah, we're good. What are we for time? No one uh, talk, talk, or? Oh, we're still here. So okay, yeah, that's good. This okay. the first one, this is the second one. You go, man. Okay, so I'm gonna show oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. Uh -huh. So, 
this is not this. <laughs> no, that's not me. <laughs> Perfect. So this is um, uh, yeah screen? yeah full screen. So this is uh, the trailer for Age of Conan. Uh, I'll let you enjoy. It. So that was the first MMO we made. Did about 150 million in revenue in the first year. So we were around 2010, so, so you can uh, put it in the timeline. So uh, this was Edgar Conan, and uh, this everything that you saw was in game. Uh, Anyone know? Escape is game. Uh, okay, escape. And then you just go for another guy. Uh, whoops. Hi guys, this is Omer. And uh, this one, uh, I wanted to give you. A s uh, th the first one was all in game, uh, in engine. This one is a CG. Uh, this is uh, the secret world. Uh, in my personal opinion, this is the best MMO that has ever been built, but that's my personal opinion. Uh, it's a very intellectual MMO where you have to think, where the NPC is going to give you a quest and they actually is lying to you. So you have to be opposite to what the NPC is doing. And your character has a, has a, a smartphone, so which has real Google, real internet. So the third person character can actually launch a window and, and uh, uh, search the real internet from the inside of the game client. Uh, so it's a very conspiracy theory. It's an MMO happening in today's time. And this one, I wanted to show you the CG. It's a CG, so it's not in game. Uh, the, the, but the, the game quality, the visual quality of the game is very similar, very close to, to this. Uh, just to give you the, uh, uh, th th this is not the biggest CG, but it's the one that I really, really enjoy the most. So it's, uh, this one is for me. <laughs> EA was our uh, publisher. So the first one was a dragon in the, in the faction. She's a Templar. And we have Illuminati as well. All these monsters are actually bosses in the game. And this is the Illuminati one. For uh, a 
I would say 90% uh, of the software engineer at Kong Kong uh, chose Illuminati as a faction. fight is um, a humongous uh, raid fight with uh, where you need uh, three team of 25 player to beat uh, the boss you're gonna see here uh, it's really really hard fight this needs a real guild to, to do it And uh, the scale between the bus and the people in the real game, it's the same scale. You're actually fighting on three level of a building, but the guy is, is covering all three levels of the building. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it and uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, if anyone has uh, any questions or anything, I'm, uh, I'm open uh, now or maybe after, uh, uh, yeah, 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 I'm seeing you. Super. Hello, a leadership talk. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, we are. You are very welcome to to that club again. Okay, <laughs> but uh, I have to find another subject. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. So let's have a short break. Thanks. Five minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and then then proceed with the second talk by.
of you like a wave returns to the sea into the blue they change but in a cycle that i can't lose each painful but delightful to live through you came into my life just like a night not for long just a time just like another season maybe this time next year you'll reappear for no reason but i'll cherish every day until you find my way this season Just like your mind Like the sun gives in to the moon Into the night Time continues marching It slowly crawls With each new one starting I recall Whoa. You came into my life Just like Good night
like a never fading whisper in the breeze. Oh, we will keep on changing all over again. Yeah, we.
So, hi. Uh, oh. uh, wait a second. And the background. Okay, let's uh, uh, move on. We're ready. So, I'm also uh, with the management background. Uh, I think my management title is the total LinkedIn bombing by being the one and only chief poltergeist officer, which is also a kind of a culture thing. I kind of uh, subtitle that with uh, I move things in unexpected ways. Uh, I have also been in the uh, management side from a very young age. Uh, when I was 17, I was the last Comsomol secretary of Tallinn Real Gol. So uh, I also have learned by uh, doing a lot of things. Uh, currently, the most of the things I'm doing is uh, related to Zone, where my official title uh, is actually Marketing and Communications, which is kind of boring, and also Chief Data Protection Officer, which is uh, even more boring and more scary. So I like to be going with uh, all kinds of uh, different titles. So what we are doing, we are the Estonia's largest uh, web hosting company with presences in Estonia and uh, Netherlands in Amsterdam. And we are selling some things which are costing like uh, Kavanos and Latte uh, to people who are thinking they should cost even less. And uh, who are uh, usually uh, thinking that uh, all of the stack that's there is uh, managed by us and we are making everything secure but the reality is a bit uh, different when I'm looking at uh, one of our random servers uh, this is actual uh, count of uh, different web applications on one physical uh, hosting server I think there are the number of sites is probably perhaps between 800 and 1000 and uh, these are the detected uh, applications. Looks nice. So there is WordPress, 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 Joomla, Tropa, Drupal, Magento, Joomla, WordPress, um, and so on. The details are not so important as the difference with the next picture. <laughs> so all of these were different WordPress versions, and uh, these are the ones which are up to date. 
Uh, by the way, I, I think we are coming to something like 12 or 16 percent of the applications on the server are actually uh, patched. Most of them are very old. Uh, and that brings to me to the situation where, uh, uh, well, the previous presenter was uh, speaking about, about fictitious worlds where you have monsters lurking around and you need to be out protecting everything then for us it's uh, every day our job is the cyber oncology to tell the code which uh, probably seems like normal code uh, from that one if a code starts with socialism and capitalism uh, and communist party it probably uh, is something malicious and this one also uh, even when re reading backwards it still looks a bit uh, malicious so we're kind of feeling uh, like uh, this part of town. This is actually uh, Taravi slums from Mumbai. And as you see, the guy who took the photo I got from Flickr has been taking it safely from his uh, car, car window uh, because there are some guys doing something. And I think his choice is very wise. There probably isn't nothing he should be doing on the other side of this uh, nicely decorated bridge. Unfortunately, we are living there. And for that, we try to get people to think more about uh, actually uh, securing uh, their applications. And how do you do that? You act, the only way I have found, which is uh, uh, also can be uh, mm, uh, gamified, is actually helping them to search for vulnerabilities. So we have been doing uh, things like helping some uh, school kids who are doing their land parties. And I'm telling that, uh, OK, your land party, which we are sponsoring with some uh, Steam gift cards, is a very cool thing. But I'm putting uh, another gift card here, which is like the, all of your team is get, going to get if you can hack, hack into this box. And it is uh, slowly gaining some thing that some guys are actually thinking that okay, maybe I shouldn't just be concentrating on shooting them up. Maybe I should actually try to understand what's happening in the computers. And hopefully at some point we can get to the point, uh, place where uh, people are ha ha happy with that. So the text is, uh, Zone doesn't know anybody who knows anybody who would not have started by hacking games. Which actually is true. We, I made a, a study in our company and it turns out we don't know anybody who hasn't been started by doing something with games and uh, something which is more or less illegal. Uh, in official educational spheres, uh, it is a problematic. This is actually from Tartu School's uh, land party where my roll-up was up and uh, 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 headmaster of school came and asked to pro uh, wipe out the word uh, mango the hacking. So uh, they nicely put the white paper there, and when the director went away, they took away and kept hacking. Anyway, so that's the attitude. So, and we sta I started with very simple things, like providing something which, what's that? <coughs> but yeah, probably page 64. It took them, on first year, I think, two hours to come to the idea that uh, the, there is something. They were calling me and asking, what, what's the hint? And they said, I know, hints, hint, hints on the roll-up. And they had probably assembled that into the physical pieces before coming to the question, oh, this can be some, somebody had called their older brother. So what's important with all, all things related to security, it is that the training is something that comes always uh, first. This is actually my other hobby, which is uh, voluntary marine rescue. So at the better days, we are looking uh, very broad and nice. And on the worst days, uh, we are needed to go to swim without uh, our dry suits. And actually, the most important picture is the one on the left. When you are talking about security or training people about security, you must use games and visuals which make people feel the pain in their uh, inner core. Yes, yeah, it's an anchor. 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 anchor from, because this is a boating thing. If, if you look at this face, you can probably understand that uh, <laughs> there has, hasn't been a, a practical situation like, like that. But my own. Uh, you know, like, uh, he's 
Uh, probably, yeah, this is just uh, some kind of uh, Stockholm syndrome <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but actually, my own uh, greatest fear in uh, real marine rescue is uh, one case from a couple of years ago when I think it was uh, it, on ISAR where some guy during the Anibav jumped over the uh, bonfire and actually didn't jump over but into that. So the team who went there had to tend somebody who had been for in fire and there was like one and a half hour waiting until the ambulances were able to come or whatever. So I'm, I'm always thinking with all of the security situations about these things that can go, go wrong. And uh, how to train myself to be actually ready because until you haven't tried your secure things then uh, nothing can go uh, better. This is actually from uh, last year's 2017 uh, Lock Shield which is the, not only the greatest, but practically the only live fire cyber exercise. Everybody else is doing them on the desktop scenario basis. And uh, uh, this is Estonian blue team. Here are strategists. Uh, there are legal department. I came in over the Windows admins and uh, uh, the system admins. Uh, here, here is the Linux. Uh, admins, uh, network admins, and somewhere there uh, is uh, Andres Reinman and uh, my desk was here on the website. So as actually, I had been actually uh, in the zone for that time for like uh, one and a half years or, or so, uh, and uh, I had tried to see how I can detect the attacks and how I can protect our uh, infrastructure or our customer sites from, uh, from attacks. And now I was able to actually test and see if I am in unfamiliar territory thrown into somebody else's network that is completely, uh, basically prepared by the red team, the guys who are going to attack, and if I'm able to protect that. So it was like 20 teams, uh, 900 participants uh, last year. That's our uh, network from that time. That's uh, the VIPs showing the same network. I'm just showing that it's uh, looking similar. Uh, green team builders, red team attackers, uh, uh, white team is, uh, is uh, they're called blondes, user simulation team. And yellow was, uh, let's say stra strategy evaluation is probably the best term for that. Blue team is not here because blue teams are in everybody's home country. They're connected over uh, VPNs to the central uh, playground. Some other pictures. This is the red, red team. Of course, you can't take pictures of red team, so uh, that's all I got. And the network is something very classical. If you are taking uh, into a part your own network, then it's probably uh, similar. So uh, what do we have? We have some kind of uh, firewalls. There is internets coming in, some uh, uh, routers. There is the militarized zone for everything that I was related to, like web servers and, uh, and so on. Then there is uh, operations of the play, play air, airport where we were working. Uh, uh -huh. And they are simulated by these blondes, who are actually most are not blondes and most are male, just to make sure that I'm not making any sensitive jokes. I'm, I'm making anyway, but whatever. Uh, uh, then there was lab. Well, this is actually basically like, uh, like uh, ops and demilitarized zone, but whatever can happen inside the networks because they are the labs guys, they are doing everything. So this is actually the disaster zone for everything. Uh, then there was the, actually the uh, plane operations of uh, uh, driving some kind of uh, drones uh, flying around and keeping them up, providing a video feed to uh, headquarters uh, and so on. And for the airport there was also a power management system, meaning that uh, if you lose power, you lose the game. Probably. And uh, industrial control system for uh, fuel handling. Uh, also, again, uh, what could be possibly going wrong when you are tanking fuel, fuel to airplanes? This is just fun and games. Uh, so both of these, like from the SCADA side, uh, both uh, built on uh, uh, actual uh, Siemens industrial uh, platforms. This is the view from the organizer's side. So they had beat video, video falls. This is actually the picture of the drone uh, video feed that needed to go around. 
they try to mess up and provide different kind of uh, false feed there. These are the very, very fancy power uh, system uh, devices. These things attached here are actually uh, uh, pyrotechnics. So uh, if uh, uh, somebody's uh, power system failed, then there was a uh, real pyrotechnics going up, uh, bang and smoke, and I think there were even fans that were blowing that towards the uh, jury. Uh, okay, and uh, when you're thinking, uh, while you're designing these systems, you're probably thinking that, okay, these are all isolated systems and we are very, very nicely running them, but actually turns out that uh, the guys in the operations want to interact with all of the other things, which are probably on the other side of airport, and they must have connections. There is no such thing as cutting off the connections because people must do the work. Machines must think. Well, okay, and then in the same network are these uh, lab guys. And this is actually an interesting uh, picture because uh, they put it uh, on public website, but it has uh, some part of the scheme that are missing from my one, what we, we knew about our network. There is something which is uh, missing from here. Uh, here is also something. Here is some external uh, IPv6 ADSL connection that somebody has installed to, work, to make it easier for them to do their research and development work and so on. So the typical uh, well-developed organization, uh, organizational uh, security. So what are we dealing with there? On, uh, I think the total number of systems uh, on this network was like 150. There were tens of Linux and Windows computers and Macs and, and, and whatever. And uh, our main uh, thing was to keep uh, three things uh, safe. There was also some wikis and uh, Redmine and, and whatever. But there was WordPress, there was a Java web shop. Well, something that looked like the web shop but was mostly made of uh, box. Uh, and then code. And there was a custom PHP app that I think was somebody's uh, diploma for, from uh, Tallinn Technical University or somewhere. Uh, which see it looked like uh, written by uh, drunken pandas, but, but actually was uh, very well designed and I'm not allowed to go into too much detail because they said that I need to write new one and I, I'm not sure if I can drink that much to write this thing. Uh, everything looks uh, nice and cool of course. This is the uh, WordPress site uh, I was working with. And so what could possibly go uh, wrong? Yeah, question. Uh, this is a question and this, uh, as uh, the makers of the system didn't consider the uh, CSF as of a much of a challenge for us to solve. It may be also, maybe this picture is taken from the time where I had repaired the website. And there was no scoring for correct CSS, so it was uh, off the scope. Uh, and there are, uh, I'm coming to some other reasons that, that might be. I, I don't exactly remember uh, from which, which point this picture is. So, the common attack vectors to this site. Actually, they, they told the WordPress was made just to, to, to give uh, a teams a possibility to protect at least something. It's a WordPress. Just fucking update it. So, it had, of course, a uh, vulnerable uh, 4.7 point, I think, uh, 1 WordPress version that had been uh, having uh, core vulnerability uh, from, I think, March of that year. We were doing it uh, in mid-April. Uh, there was a bunch of uh, plugins uh, that were either backdoored or out of date and had some vulnerabilities, or they were completely abandoned plugins. So, what, what these, what, what's an easiest thing to do is, uh, I don't know, reinstall the plugin. Just get some uh, intern to remove the plugins and put the new plugins and you have the thing which is coming from the plugin repository and everything is safe, it's not nice, nice and safe. No, there were plugins that uh, probably hadn't been ever discovered to be vulnerable and uh, there was no uh, fix for them either because they were like last updated seven years ago. Then uh, small changes in code. Actually something which is, uh, I think, very evil. If you uh, look at this uh, code, I, maybe it, it should be a bit bigger, but here's some kind of uh, whatever uh, database uh, sentence, and it uh, does look pretty common, but when you are seeing here 
then uh, somebody has changed uh, uh, the placement of uh, some kind of uh, it has been a string which is going in there and uh, it is adding uh, some data uh, to the SQL sentence probably creating uh, uh, SQL injection capability into this code but just changing couple of uh, characters so when the first samples and some samples I'm going to show you about malicious code do look malicious cancerous on the view, first view there is a ton of way of making minor changes to the code in a way to actually gain access and I, and I think in my WordPress case there was uh, what, what, what I do in these cases is I diff the files so this is actually done with the uh, git uh, for I don't know I, I kind of li li uh, like it uh, so there were a lot of places where small changes like these were made like not using the uh, whatever uh, get variables but using the request or something like that and uh, creating some new ways of uh, uh, vulnerabilities that somebody doesn't uh, notice immediately. So basically what I have learned from that is the only code you can trust in production is the one that uh, is uh, basically checksums the same as you have in your uh, version management. Oh, fun, fun other things. Uh, this is actually from a GIF file or GIF or what's the correct one? I think there's a debate about that. Uh, which uh, looks like uh, completely legal and then it has some PHP at the end. Turns out that it's pretty easy to configure your Apache or whatever web server to actually uh, interpret whatever files that have the PHP start marker in them to be inter interpreted as uh, uh, PHP. So, which means that it's possible to have, I think I, I made here uh, mention of uh, minor configuration tweaks. So, whatever code you have thought that, okay, GIF files, this is not my problem if somebody uploads a GIF file because who's going to execute that? Ha! Huh. Maybe your ops guys have a bit misconfigured the web server. Or maybe the malicious actor has done the fact that they have not hacked the code, but they have hacked just the Apache config file. And by uploading uh, GIF files, you can have uh, remote code execution. Uh, so, uh, well, I have been uh, working with these things, and I'm mixing here uh, some timelines. I'm putting in some things which are not from the log shields, but uh, comparable, uh, which are from real life, uh, mostly because, as I mentioned, I'm uh, not in the right to disclose all of the uh, red team's secrets. Uh, what I am showing has been clear for them. Uh, this is actually my one of my collections of uh, uh, bad uh, code found in server. So everything here, I, I especially like, there is a favicon, there is some kind of binary code, uh, there are some something that looks probably like a temp file. Uh, I, I, I like the backups. This is, this is, this is especially cool. Uh, for example, especially in the PHP, if you have something like a config file, if the config file is named by your text editor into underscore PHP, then, uh, uh, then uh, well, under, under underscore backup, then it's not interpreted as uh, PHP, if the server is configured correctly, of course. And your passwords and everything are shown. This, uh, I, I have a couple of examples of that uh, coming later. Uh, uh, the interesting thing and why I'm collecting these is I'm interested, there, there is one uh, view from our, I know our customer side, is that, okay, there is malicious code and maybe you have this uh, antivirus or some kind of a tool, just let's scan and find the malicious files and remove them. So, I have been doing a couple of times a, a test where I have taken uh, the set of uh, fresh uh, malicious files from a web server and run them through different things. I think for, for whatever reason I'm missing from here uh, uh, virus total, but I think I uh, in some t other table I have got also a virus uh, total. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I manually know they are bad files. Uh, and uh, Nimbusek is some, uh, a tool produced some uh, Austrian uh, startup that we are reselling. Uh, Ivolit is a Russian uh, PHP uh, analyzing uh, script. Paranoid is Ivolit in paranoid mode or detecting more. 
Kutera is one WordPress product or uh, plugin. Node 32 is a antivirus. Dr. Rev is antivirus, and Kot MLS is another uh, plugin. Uh, number of threats found, and uh, usually they are finding uh, in the good case something like uh, the 40-50 percent of the malicious code, if there is uh, zero false positives. Uh, the finding rate went up with paranoid mode up to 90 percent, but there was as much uh, non-malicious files tagged as malicious. So at the moment you are thinking about uh, some, let's say, average user or average developer needing to deal with these uh, uh, false positives, they just say that, screw you. Uh, uh, so, uh, and even with 90%, if you think you can clean or find something with, which is 90% uh, accurate, then you are still going to leave 10% of uh, backdoors on, the, uh, on your uh, system if you are doing anything but uh, uh, clean uh, reinstall. How the process is going? Usually, they have taken over the site and uh, put on their backdoors and put on their, uh, uh, let's say, business business code, something they are making money with. Now you find it uh, and remove the code that you have found. They are usually coming back in eight to twenty-four hours to look for where's my code, dude. Where did you put my code? Why did you remove that? Bad guy. Uh, uh, usually the, some kind of uh, robot is coming uh, scanning first. Uh, if it is unsuccessful, then comes a guy who seems to be checking everything manually from some kind of table which lists uh, what uh, he or she uh, must have on your uh, system. And uh, when, uh, and when uh, uh, they don't find you, they are just saying, okay, let's take this server off the charge, let's move on to the next job. So, but you need to be 100% because they know what they have put there and where exactly. So 90% uh, uh, detection rate is uh, no good. Uh, because what's in inside these things? For example, this is a, uh, this Favicon icon. By Favicon icon, I rebranded it uh, to text to be uh, able to show. So, again, some kind of obfusc obfuscated uh, nice uh, code to avoid uh, easy detection. Uh, it's used by putting a nicely obfuscated include in uh, wherever, wherever they please. I think configuration files are very nice, th nice places. And this one is actually very visible. Sometimes it's going in here. So, uh, inside the comment fields there is uh, some parts of uh, PHP code and uh, so on. So. It can be hidden very well. No, yes, this is just my test system, so not, not from live one. Uh, another one. Actually, finding these by detecting page 64 decode is pretty easy. So uh, they are making a, a lot of things to uh, disguise uh, all of these things. I especially like, like the comment here. Do not remove this file. <laughs> the system will not work. Okay. Uh, there was also the question of the files which were named dot suspect. So this anti antivirus has gone over all, all these files already. These are suspect files. You can just leave them here. Never leave anything that hasn't come from your uh, production uh, uh, repository or, or that has come from your repository on the production systems. Because uh, if you keep mess there, then who knows, whatever might be there. This is uh, another nice example coming uh, uh, probably from Russian speaking people because uh, they tend to have uh, this uh, Windows encodings uh, and, 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 uh, and Windows Sphere and, uh, uh -huh. and when my, my, most of the things are usually doing something like base64 uh, decode and evaling uh, something or other then this one is now cool. Turns out that, uh, especially in PHP, there is a bunch of functions that can also cause execution. For example, before I think PHP 7, there was uh, 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 regular expression functions had the option E, which actually causes some things to be executed. And there is actually a ton of examples on the internet uh, about ways to uh, use uh, seemingly very uh, simple functions to actually provide shell access or remote 
uh, code execution. Uh, ah, that's another one. So there is a, a bunch of different uh, things and uh, when you start to look at these, uh, you're actually opening the file and you're always seeing that, uh, okay, oh, this one is a, a bit different. I, I actually, from visual perspective, I added that uh, somebody has uh, gone to the length of actually designing the obfuscation with underscores. I think, and, and I, I think the number of underscores in each of these variables is, is different, so uh, it's encoded by the number of underscores. So there is so many different ways of actually trying to fool all, all of these uh, detection engines. And then there are more places where you can actually tune the things uh, about configuration. This is on the Apache side, the HD access file, where you can uh, just tell that uh, if there are some numbers on the path, then uh, you should access uh, some kind of a file inside some folder and provide it uh, uh, the, mm, some, some part of this uh, value. Why it's important? It's important because uh, when you're thinking, how could I protect my uh, solution? You could practically say that, okay, let's just uh, tell that we don't let, uh, we don't uh, let the PHP execution in uh, whatever CSS folders or something like that. Ha. Huh. It can't be executed, but it can be uh, included, and I think it can be also run with uh, uh, rewrite rules from different uh, part, because it's uh, not exactly the same way. And here, just inside the regular rewrite rules, there is uh, something uh, else which I think is, again, malicious. I haven't seen that uh, kind of a thing uh, uh, used for anything uh, non-malicious in my life. Again, very small changes that give people access to files that they should not have access to. Uh, okay, just another nice one. So, the solution I'm doing all, always in these cases is just burn it down and redeploy. What could be a problem with that attitude? Especially considering we have like, like I don't know, 30 something uh, uh, companies' websites on our servers. Well, it usually turns out the discussion goes like that. You have, I'm asking them in email uh, from some project in Galaxy far, far, far away, so please provide me some kind of architecture of your software project which uh, had to include PHP and uh, Node.js and uh, Express application and uh, whatever. And the answer is usually, so we kind of don't know, we are just doing it ad hoc as it happens and could you just help us deploy that? Which means that, uh, I don't know. The situation, and, the, and some part of that should be on fire actually, but uh, it doesn't show here. Uh, so in these situations, coming back and telling that, uh, guys, let's just redeploy your application can come up as a great uh, obstacle to actually getting your system uh, working and cleaned up. So I'm doing some, uh, it easier way. Uh, replace what can be replaced, and in case of the log shield, uh, fake the functionality of the rest. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as I'm not paid by hour, uh, I have my own tools. So uh, for doing, doing these things on uh, WordPress, I have uh, my own tool. This is just the help page of the things I can uh, different ways uh, do with the WordPress applications. It starts with, it includes things like creating a Git repository uh, with the different line endings, doing the commits, and also doing updates and changes of all of the parts while making a uh, Git commit uh, in between each of the update cycles. So I'm basically able to take an application that's broken, that doesn't have source available or a clean version available, and update it part by part. I'm seeing in Git everything that has changed and uh, if needed, I can roll back any of the changes if it uh, breaks some kind of uh, functionality. Is so it written on PHP? Oh. Is it on PHP? This? Yes. No, this is uh, shell. 
this is uh, actually my 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 uh, my ev only ever written uh, shell application, and I was already offered uh, task to teach uh, shell in uh, Tallinn Technical University, which probably either shows that I'm a real shell ace, or maybe their uh, requirements for teaching shell are not very high. It is it is using Wordp uh, WordPress uh, CLI for uh, doing the actual job in the back end, but it just uh, is the summary of things. Did anybody else have a question? No, but you can call me or write me, and I, 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 I'm happy. This is not how open source works. Ah. This is, this is not how open works. <laughs> no, that's fucking how security works. <laughs> why, why, the, why the hell do you think I need to put all of my tools that I'm using uh, open source so or, or, so on, op, or on public places? I'm, I'm, I'm even uh, afraid of leaving these on the servers I'm cleaning up because what if I have not been successful? This guy comes back from uh, whatever, Tula or Moscow, they are usually coming, and uh, finds my tools. Uh, I, I, I have considered having this distributed to all of our farms, so I, I have it easy to use, but no, I'm I every time putting it myself and taking it away. So, by putting security tools on your server, you should also make sure that if there is a risk of compromise, and if the server is connected to the internet, which is the definition of the web server then uh, there is a risk of compromise and you should not leave, leave your tools uh, lying around. Which is actually something which is the same thing about your uh, working, your garage or whatever. Also, clean up your tools and make everything tidy. I'm not very good at that, but I'm trying to be good at that. Unfortunately, what we didn't find, find uh, zero days or something like that. So basically, most of the things were fixable by uh, Mm, updating the plugins and uh, or maybe replacing them with something uh, with uh, comparable uh, functionality and making sure that scoring system uh, is uh, happy with that. I uh, was thinking to be uh, helping uh, them uh, this year so uh, I actually have uh, prepared for some school guys a small competition and everybody can uh, later at home uh, take their beers and uh, try that. And here is a possibility to get a real WordPress, uh, it's not actually zero day, but it is a uh, WordPress plugin that uh, is still in the repository and it has a security problem which is totally face palmable. It, 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 it has so stupid thing and it is exactly the right uh, thing to start experimenting with. So uh, when you go to uh, there is a site called hack.ee, but ha A is uh, number four. So you can just uh, register here and you will be given a brand new uh, 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 droplet on uh, DigitalOcean uh, that you can try to find out what's the vulnerability. Uh, why I'm also uh, using these examples and why I'm using this, especially this example is that there is always a question with all of these uh, things that where do I start here? So if somebody goes there and tries to click re register, it probably won't work. So what, do we, what are you going to do if the registration doesn't work on the website? Just close it. <laughs> no, but there are dragons. Press register. No. No, slash, slash register. Slash or slash admin. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, this is this is also a possibility. Something else. Inspection. Yes, exactly. So usually, uh, most of the things uh, start off with uh, looking at the uh, code, and usually, uh, when you are looking at all of these uh, great exercises, there is some kind of uh, uh, hint. So this one has. Uh, a disabled uh, button and then there is some some more uh, with uh, creating a field for entering an email and when you are successful you will uh, be given a very nicely by the way video game themed uh, named uh, server for example my one this time is psychedelic ice in my pocket whatever that means and also a uh, animal named uh, name and when you open it, you will be on the website. 
This is actually a running in a couple of seconds from uh, registrations and it looks like a default WordPress. It has uh, instructions what to do and it probably has some hints. Again, if it looks like page 64 then probably it is page 64. Oh, and if you want, by, by, by the way, uh, here under here are some uh, other cool uh, places to try out. Some of them are some companies uh, uh, HR, uh, HR themed employment or just a, a talent finding uh, site, but uh, non related to me, but I have been ha having real fun solving their puzzles. And I think this is uh, something if you want to uh, learn more about the op opposing side than uh, trying to solve the puzzles is cool. So here, when you go to the, see the trick, the explanation, the, the code will be um, come on, did I press it? Or did I press Facebook like? Scroll down. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. One should never ask plus indexes or minus indexes. Hmm. If you Google that, then turns out that uh, it's something from again Apache configuration, and the plus indexes means that all of the directories are going to have uh, indexes in them. So finding what plugins we are uh, we need to hack, probably can uh, find out what are the plugin folders in the WordPress. Perhaps you can find something which is uh, indexable. Perhaps when you know the plugin name, you can actually download it from internet. You can see what are the components. And this ex exercise is actually solvable completely without any external tools. You don't need to have Curl or, or, or any command line uh, tools. You can just uh, hack the site and get uh, admin access uh, or remote code execution, whatever you want, remote shell, uh, by, from just your browser's inspector. Uh, I know guys who have done that from uh, just giving, given the first hack, view, uh, ha uh, given the first URL in half an hour, and they have been web developers. So everybody who is better than web developers should be doing it. Uh, well, uh, at least in half an hour, or maybe two, because uh, if it takes it uh, two hours or three hours of first time, it the solving of the first round of exercises uh, tends to take longer uh, and while you are learning and doing these you're starting to see patterns and you're st starting to solve the puzzles uh, faster and faster and you're getting to know more about that that's like doing whatever sport like running the first you're running very slow and everybody's running faster than you and then at some, at some point you are starting to understand that oh guys I can do that I can run cool so, and this was a good one because I, it was made by me, so I was at the discretion of showing uh, some of uh, the ways of getting into it without anybody telling that, Peter, why you are showing, we are going to use that on something and, uh, and so. But try to go it through and find at least what is the plugin. Uh, that servers will be killed in some time. Because this is, uh, ah, okay, this is, uh, uh, oh, another interesting uh, file I found from a hacked file. There was a guys from, uh, uh, if anybody knows about Webarks, these are some startup guys doing some kind of security product, and their method of finding ha uh, fighting hackers is leaving readme files, which is not a very effective process. The Java web shop, uh, it had uh, vulnerable components. Uh, the worst pass for pa uh, part of that was it uh, was accessible over web sockets. I had imagination if it's being accessed just by URL or, or let's say get and post parameters or whatever, I can put in front of that some kind of web application firewall and just uh, uh, whitelist everything that is needed and do something like that. Uh, but no, they had put in the web sockets. And I had apps, nobody in our team had any idea how to uh, uh, monitor correctly and uh, modify and block WebSocket uh, solutions. So if you are developing something and uh, want to screw up your security guys in your company real hard, then please do use WebSockets. And uh, take unsanitized input from WebSockets. Whatever is going, because it's WebSockets, it's very secure, you can just go with that direct to SQL. 
And of course, forgotten code. This is a place which uh, I think uh, uh, last year I think there was uh, Joomla problems related to in the latest versions of Joomla relating to some forgotten code in some classes that was possible to be used in forums to create uh, access to everything. So that's actually the applications from, la from last year. I'm keeping it in a folder named trash for some reason. It probably was pretty much a trash. Yes, to be uh, in the front. Okay, but I, as a programmer, I read it not trash. Uh, uh, as a uh, content manager, I'm just uh, getting it to the top of the list. Uh, because, uh, as, I, as you see, I, I am a very organized person myself. But there was some, something called uh, Batik, which uh, had some nice, uh, nice uh, vulnerabilities from 2015. So if somebody is uploading uh, SVG image uh, for conversion to PNG or JPG, then uh, it, I think, basically gave uh, them uh, a, a possibility to read files and create denial of service. There were some uh, other things. Uh, fortunately, they had not had time to include the latest uh, PATIC uh, problems there. My problem was that, of course, there was no sor source code. Okay, the first thing you're going to a server, which doesn't have source code, is you look everywhere. Because it is possible somebody has forgotten the source code there. In my case, I found it from uh, the main user's uh, downloads folder. Uh, no, not the downloads folder or somewhere. I, I, I did found the source code of the previous version. So I uh, had actually very, very good ways to inspect everything that uh, went in there. I also was able to find from, I think it was uh, something like download history or something, a name of the file, which was SVG exploit. So I knew how they are going to come in, just by looking at that. Unfortunately, I know exactly nothing about Java, so I used I use the pizza approach. So I called my friend uh, Heike, who is working in uh, Icefire, and uh, asked to grab his uh, wife and son and come over because I'm going to make some pizza. And uh, while uh, wives and kids were having pizza, we set up uh, the way to learn uh, how to debug, debug Java and, uh, and uh, work with things, because he has been working with that. Uh, I, I think the dream he's explaining here is the result of looking at the work we did. So uh, if there is a need to translate that into English, that he, he had a dream, I need to uh, direct a, uh, in Tallinn, uh, terminal, Tallinn Harbor, Harbor's A terminal, a passenger airplane by uh, waving hands. And it was made com more complicated by having a, a Casalan cistern attached. Uh, he talked to the pilot. It was an older lady from uh, India who said that uh, for some reason uh, the truck drivers are not allowed to drive uh, airplanes. So it, it's ex exactly the confusion level of the things when you are working in a system which is created by people just to trick you into uh, letting them uh, hack, hack into that. So patch, remove unused code put some uh, web application firewall in front of that for other things except the uh, WebSocket thing that I had patched. And when it crashes, just restart. When the blondes are calling that their WebSocket is not working, then just restart it. Because uh, I had broken something and I didn't have during the live exercise time to fix it uh, more. And then there was a custom PHP application, uh, which had uh, most everything uh, in a way like, like that. So it was completely SQL injecta injectable. Uh, Andres took uh, that on one and uh, spent, I think, a uh, full day. We got it just a day before exercise. There was just basically 24 hours to fix it, and it uh, was huge. And to sanitize all of the inputs and find uh, all of the things, find all of the configuration problems. So if something seems to be usually denied, then it was, of course, uh, in this configuration, allow. And again, something which is visually very difficult to notice un unless you are knowing exactly what kinds of tricks you are going to see. Uh, because if it's the wrong way of allowing, 
Uh, th this is actually not, not from exercise, from, but from a live site. Uh, another example, uh, if uh, somebody has not up, set up the way of uh, blocking dot, uh, .env and there happens to be a uh, configuration file there, then uh, it can be very easily read. So, very nice things, because dot means it's hidden. You don't know, you, you can't, can't access that. I don't know. Why? You don't know, you're not seeing it in just ls or something like that. So. And I especially like these uh, security cells, generate me, that rocks. Uh, so, and this is actually from a uh, live, live, uh, live site uh, of something else. Uh, and then I actually, uh, I, I can't, as I can't tell uh, the, oh, oh, the more complicated backdoors, uh, I uh, picked some of my own. Uh, I was doing some training for Estonian Cyber Olympics youth team uh, last September and uh, I wrote them some uh, applications, so some WordPress installs uh, which were being, uh, getting external traffic so they needed to learn to log, uh, log the traffic, find what, how the attacks are coming in and find the backdoors. They were actually very pretty good so we did, uh, in, I think we did uh, two hour practice and they solved uh, most of the teams solved most of the problems, very cool. Usually, uh, and then they are the top Estonian guys. Everybody else is, uh, I, I, I met these guys later on this uh, competition I did in Tartu. I saw somebody getting in. And when I uh, went back and looked at some kind of uh, fingerprints or, uh, or foot marks or something, I found that, okay, that was a guy from uh, Cyber Olympics. So full school did nothing, and then there was one, one guy from the, the, this level who got in. So there is worse training or used to actually know how to hack. So I made them some uh, very simple things to start off by just uh, taking uh, post parameters. And I, I think there was also one with uh, get parameters that is uh, making it possible to execute shell and get something back nicely formatted thanks to pre-tags pre in uh, uh, HTML, and, it, and it's easy to see how to, uh, mm, how to find uh, the malicious uh, request from the gets. Post is more complex because it's usually not logged, but again, uh, we were talking about some tricks of uh, including some, uh, uh, in PHP you can configure some scripts to run before the main code, and it's very easy to log your posts and uh, everything there, so we were doing things like this. And then I made my own shell, uh, which is uh, some kind of uh, translation, uh, whatever, and uh, does a lot of magic with uh, different things. And, uh, and probably, if you're looking, it, it does look just like not sense making. It doesn't look malicious, but when you're when you're looking at that, you're probably going to tell that. What, what is this thing? Well, <laughs> it's probably uh, uh, doing some numero numerology or something like that. Uh, holistic view of uh, something or that. CRC 32, whatever, I don't know. So, something like that. Uh, actually, what it does is uh, uh, it takes a couple of uh, random headers from uh, HTML, uh, HTTP request. Uh, by check it, doing some uh, checksums, uh, finds which, which, which header might be the one which is containing the, uh, I think, encoded code that they need to be executing and then executing the code. Why I did that was exactly because the people are thinking about things like, okay, we can put some kind of firewall in, in front of that. No, I can probably get around your firewall. I can communicate with my backend uh, uh, backdoor code in your system by providing uh, the information bit by bit or by using some things you're probably not logging and so on. So uh, there are ways of uh, getting in but uh, the guys were very smart in two hours they had solved all of the tasks and uh, been able to uh, find a way to create also to generate the request. They also cracked the, how, how the uh, how the uh, code was generated and basically were able to, if, if they would have wished uh, 
to write a block for this kind of uh, particular thing. Again, in Lockshield, there was also a case of application which exactly was communicating with some very varied input with something residing somewhere in the back of the system. Oh, by the way, and this one also is completely sitting inside the uh, WordPress uh, uh, mm, typical con configuration or typical whatever plugin module or, or wherever it doesn't look uh, malicious, it looks like a code and it hooks itself completely into the WordPress infrastructure and is able to process, I don't know, Ajax or whatever requests uh, very nicely. There is no pattern in log files. I can be accessing whatever pages and providing these pieces of he header to uh, communicate with my malicious code. Uh, actually, while uh, I was uh, we, while while we wrote this code, as I wrote it uh, late in the evening, I wanted to test if it uh, works on uh, uh, on uh, other uh, hosting providers also. So we loaded up it to some things. This is currently simulated because I'm not telling uh, where it happened. Uh, and uh, we found that uh, uh, there are different customer folders on the same server. I can't uh, list the other customers' folders, but I'm able to do things like these. Wow! Meaning I, uh, we were just uh, experimenting with a uh, uh, PHP shell and we found that uh, we are able to uh, do uh, lateral uh, movement uh, from uh, one user to uh, another. So the problems in the configurations are, are very common. So the view of the typical hosting server is something like that. There are customers and they are divided by uh, Linux user rights and if you can move from one place to another. Okay, this was that. So basically, how are we time wise? I should be probably... Yeah, okay. I have also a little, I think, uh, 100 slides or something like that. We're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, at least we're on the same slide. Uh, mm, uh, so, Tantra's internet, different circles of uh, serious internet business and not so serious internet business. Uh, so, what were the things that uh, we went through? Actually, the most important thing when you are thinking about uh, about your code which is running somewhere is uh, try to take a more holistic view of the environment and think of all of the stack which is under you. Yes, you are using very good frameworks. I know frameworks are sanitizing everything and there is no SQLI and something. Uh, the amount to get uh, through your firework or may, uh, uh, framework or maybe bypass that uh, might not be that big. Don't trust anything. Always assume there is a way to be compromised. And also, as was the example with these uh, client folders, uh, we had a discussion today with uh, an IT security manager who told that uh, you could actually use these uh, different clients under one uh, account. What's the, what's the problem of having them in, under one account? And I said, like, I don't know, you are the IT security manager or something like that. No, just explain me. And I said that, I don't know. Have you ever tried in your, uh, or in your uh, uh, command line going doing uh, cd dot dot and ls and finding that uh, if there are no writes, you can see everybody's files. When I'm looking at the, at the PHP code of some of the uh, malware, it actually works in a way that when it launches, the first thing is, is it goes to the, uh, starts going uh, up in the uh, folder tree and uh, looking for all PHP code and uh, then uh, planting the backdoors. So the first thing in the first uh, run of the code is uh, go plant the backdoors and then start executing uh, whatever was needed. So if anything is running on the same rights, it's a total mess. And most of the things which uh, often are happening is that, uh, okay, let's take just a VPS. And I'm seeing, uh, I have a different statistics that I don't have on slides today, but I went and scanned a lot of bunch of VPSs and actually the level of updates and security tends to be pretty miserable. Uh, so, usually, access to application via routing, 
because there is a possibility to hook into the routing, like I did with the, uh, my fake plugin or whatever, directly by just accessing some files, very common in PHP, less common in, in some other things, but also in Java there can be some views which are doing things that you have for forgotten there are doing something. A very uh, malicious path or, uh, or uh, something. Passing parameters via all kinds of uh, weird ways. Mixing uh, cat posts and cookies, which is uh, one of the great vices, but especially with PHP, where you have a possibility of configuring in which order they are processed. Again, one of nice places to plant in the malicious code to uh, do something. Oh, here is user agents referrers, which are a very great place of uh, hiding whatever you don't want people to see in the log files. Uh, keeping uh, sessions and snooping sessions. Ah, oh, this is uh, something that can be done. User authentication, which uh, I didn't see there. I, okay, I, I think we had also some user authentication cases, but this is my favorite from a very well-known site called CV Estonia. Let's say CV, CV, CV online, cv.te. Uh, uh, where we had a discussion on uh, Facebook and their developer told that we are very secure, everything is passed over HTTPS. And people came to me that, people, uh, P uh, Peter, please, please look, uh, we told that it's not secure, but uh, they are telling it's secure. Could it be possible they are right? Of course not. Uh, so, uh, for a long time I had a demonstration application as a way of CVE lo login. Uh, it was possible to uh, log in. This is the capture by uh, Wireshark, and uh, I think here is uh, nicely uh, visible my uh, password. Uh, but even better is that uh, it's possible to force the value of uh, session ID. It's not reset on the login. It's not secure, so it's possible to leak it over, uh, for example, unprotected uh, Wi-Fi and uh, something else. So for I, I think one and a half year I was using on most of the conferences a way of uh, people if you want to leave uh, feedback to my presentation uh, you see the uh, secret cookie just go and leave it on right on my CV. Just, just don't post anything that's Ill illegal because uh, they probably find out your IP. Uh, they fixed it a couple of months ago and then I had to find the next one. This was Tallinn City Government. I was giving a similar lecture to uh, Tallinn Management about things and uh, Thomas Sepp, the city secretary, came five minutes before presentation to me and said, could you demonstrate something based on our systems? I said, uh, it's five minutes to stage. It's impossible to find anything vulnerable in your systems. And then I said that, Oh, wait, let's try this one thing. And of course, uh, uh, Tallinn uh, City, well, all of that. I think uh, th this is from the main uh, services portal, which has like 500. Uh, there was, there are, uh, and they have different sub portals and all they had the problem of uh, having the forced cookie and being able to grab the sessions, even if you are doing the login with mobile ID or ID card. So this was, uh, uh, this, is, this is the level. So I, I, so I was able to, in the five minutes before the presentation, to find the vulnerability and prepare the next slides, or actually a live, live demo of showing them. A bit difficult uh, thing to di uh, discuss to uh, non-technical people, but anyway. Oh, talking to the database. There are various ways of talking to database. Sometimes it can be via completely legal user interface. But what could be possibly going uh, wrong? Oh, there is a database talking back to me. Uh, possibly with a very interesting mistakes from yet another site from which I have a video. So this is edasi.org website and I'm just uh, browsing here. Wow! I'm going to the next page and I'm logged into the WordPress admin. Okay, just live site. Uh, unfortunately, can't do anything uh, why it was. It was because of uh, misconfigured caches. So somebody had managed to uh, cache the situation of the page when uh, they were, were logged in. Cache management is very difficult. I experienced the same uh, effect, should I say, on Aura, uh, Tarto Aura WhatsApp app. Once 
When I just signed in, click random link, turn out to be a sign in admin. Like try that. Yeah. Uh, price price page. It did. It did update. And it was probably written with a very nice framework. I think we so. See, yeah. We see everything correctly. So, uh, and what you could tell the, the database to do, in addition to show you some things. Oh, this is the one I, I didn't know before Lockshield, but uh, this is which, which is very cool. So actually, this is WordPress's user metadata table. And what could be a malicious use of uh, that, for example? This is the database structure of uh, MySQL. I can register a an user and make it admin. No, this means a bit. Uh, let's let's say I'm not getting admin. I'm just there is one very stupid thing in database design visible here. There is a long text field. So basically, by just uh, starting uh, posting some data into user profile into their bio field or something else. I can create the situation where I can uh, DOS the SQL server. This was something that was done, done to us uh, on uh, Lockshield 2017. Uh, we learned it hard way, so I'm, uh, this is the something that uh, I'm really finding uh, stupid that it's everywhere. Oh, talking via API, accepting, uh, mixing code and data. This is something which is especially for PHP. Result is something like that when you mix code and data. It's spaghetti code and uh, Mr. C long that. Hedgehogs. hedgehogs, yeah. Spaghetti code and hedgehogs. Uh, so, and uh, to summarize, I have one more uh, demo and something to take away and try at home uh, today or tomorrow or uh, whenever you like. Namely, uh, uh, there was one of this very simple thing which was uh, my, but there is, I think, a very good uh, learning tool for developers is uh, OWASP Jewish Shop. Has anybody tried that? One, okay. Uh, so, what it is, it is also designed to be a vulnerable application. It has probably all of the mistakes you can imagine and uh, it is something where you can uh, uh, try to uh, uh, beat your uh, beat the developer and actually uh, get in. There are also actually I think all of the problems have somewhere on the internet the solutions. So if you are feeling like you're totally stuck and you can't waste another five hours with the same problem, then just Google. It's not a kind of uh, school uh, task that you you you're not allowed allowed to cheat. You're only cheating yourself. And if you're if you cheating at the beginning and getting better at finding the problems, then I'm totally fine with that. So, how to get into the OWASP juice shop and how, how it looks like? There are various ways of uh, running it. I think the most easier one, if you are going to uh, looking for OWASP juice shop, uh, then uh, here is easy to install. And the easiest way is using Heroku. So make yourself a Heroku account, come back here and click the deploy. It will uh, deploy it in Heroku in their, uh, whatever their droplets are called. It will uh, clone the uh, repo, uh, build the application and run. So you're going to have it uh, running in uh, Heroku. So I have it uh, as an example to prove that it's possible. That's my uh, Pets choose Heroku app. I think uh, as in Heroku you need to create your own uh, 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 name for that, but uh, then it's yours. You can run it and it's running on, on these free, free instances uh, very nicely. And uh, okay, there is of course a cookie consent. I hope they're going to send me also a reminder about privacy policy soon. Uh, and then, what next? Uh, yeah, good answer, exactly, <laughs> inspector, yeah. Uh, first, like there is in Kali Linux, does anybody know Kali Linux? One, oh, okay, well, ten. So, uh, what, what is the motto of Kali Linux? Huh? No, no, no. 
The quieter you become, the more you hear. Scout around, look, feel, start to see what are the parts. Don't think, it isn't a speed sports, at least not now. In, in case space, they are also planning to do some kind of different uh, capture the flag events to get you to think quick. But at the beginning, you just go and look around and think that, OK, what could be? And I can tell you that uh, the first task is to uh, find out uh, where is the scoring port. There is a scoring port and you can somehow find it from uh, here. And uh, okay, now I, show, I, I showed you the URL probably, you can just write it down. But uh, try to find actually how to, how to get in there. You're getting to a really nice uh, scoring port which is starting to have uh, exercises with uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, difficulty levels. I think the first ones should be uh, very easy to start with. And they go like that. So there is, a, for example, cross-site scripting. There should be a way of getting uh, somehow the uh, JavaScript to display the alert box on the site. If you want, uh, each of these, uh, when you uh, click, I think uh, it also opens uh, a bit uh, deeper uh, explanation. And then if, if the explanation or hint isn't enough, you can probably go and uh, Google and find if uh, somebody can help you. Or you can maybe just try thinking a bit more. Or maybe solving a different exercise and coming back to that or maybe coming back to the exercise tomorrow morning after sleeping. And I've found actually that uh, sleeping and solving the problems in the morning is often a very good uh, thing. Apparently your brain is somehow processing the problems during the night. So, okay, let's do, do one of these. I don't want to show too much, but uh, we need to, the cross-site scripting is that we, yeah, okay. Uh, we can uh, do something like uh, that. Uh, uh, no, usually it happens when you are inputting the uh, code somewhere, somewhere in the field and because it's not, not sanitized when it's outputted back into the browser after doing the search then uh, you are going to get the result and uh, you are going to get the, the result on your scoreboard score is kept on the system. It's, I, I think uh, there is a SQLite database, so if you kill the server, put it up, uh, then, uh, and you have the cookie in the, in, the, in the browser, you can get all of in, back into your session and uh, continue hacking. So something you can completely in peace open up in the next week and uh, continue and try having your evening beers and just thinking that, oh, there was talk about cross-site scripting, what the heck might be that? So with uh, that, I'm uh, finishing this uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, oh, one more thing, sorry. There was a question about books I suggest reading. And uh, especially on the personal developer side, there is a really good book called uh, Badass, Making Users Awesome by Cathy Serra which talks about the psychology of learning. So it's good for you, and it's good for you when you're trying to market to some people, or maybe you're trying to do game development. Learn in small steps that are not too hard, because too hard learning will drive you away from that. Try to get feedback quickly. This is exactly why this tool shop is very, very nice. So it gives you the nice marks. You are getting, uh, you, are, you are seeing the progress, and you have helped. And uh, then you're repeating it on the next level, which is harder, and then harder, and then harder, which is exactly the same way you're doing uh, whatever kind of training. Thank you. You can just go hacking. Elvis, Peter. Event is uh, June 5. June 5 will be a geek out special. A small, uh, small teaser for us, for you guys. 
And thank you for coming, despite such a nice weather. And uh, see you next time. Attention, girl, I know you, know you, but you're everything I want in life. Yeah. We're fighting danger like kung fu. kung fu. The love I feel is deep inside. The others don't matter. matter. It's honestly us against the world. We're the perfect team. team. You're my dream, and I just want it. Can't get to myself. Can't get to myself. Can't get to myself, 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 can